Hey guys, how are you all doing today? So in yesterday's video, I talked about how much power Anakin lost, reducing his power to only 80% of the Emperor's, which is surely a big defeat when he was supposed to be stronger. However, just how much stronger was he supposed to be? Well, I'm gonna take any doubt away and reiterate George Lucas's quotes directly from his mouth from the Vanity Fair interview that was taken place a while back. Here we go. Anakin as Skywalker as a human being was going to be extremely powerful, but he ended up losing his legs and an arm and became partly a robot. So a lot of his ability to use the force, a lot of his powers are curved at this point because as a living form, there's not that much of him left. So his ability to be twice as good as the Emperor disappeared and now he's maybe 20% less than him. So that isn't what the Emperor had in mind. He wanted this really super guy, but that got derailed by Obi-Wan. So he finds that with Luke, he can get a more primo version if he can turn Luke to the dark side. You'll see as this goes on, Luke is faced with the same issues and practically the same scenes that Anakin is faced with. Anakin says yes, and Luke says no. You learn that Darth Vader isn't this monster, Lucas says. He's a pathetic individual who made a pact with the devil and lost, and he's trapped. He's a sad, pathetic character, not an evil big monster. I mean, he's a monster in that he's turned to the dark side and he's serving a bad master, and he's into power and he's lost a lot of his humanity. In that way, he's a monster. But beneath that, as Luke says in Return of the Jedi early on, I know there's still good in you. There's good in you, I can sense it. Only through the love of his children and the compassion of his children, who believe in him, even though he's a monster, does he redeem himself. Now, this is what I really like about Vader. He isn't the monster. He's just made a bad deal and it kind of ruined his life. That's relatable to many people in the world. You make a bad decision and you kind of get stuck in that way because, well, you're stuck. But there's always a way out. You can always change, just as Vader did. His ability to be twice as powerful as the Emperor is saying a lot, considering Palps beat Yoda in a fight and Yoda was the most powerful Jedi Grandmaster. You know, with the exception of Mace in some scenarios where Vipod could be used. But in the Force, Yoda was the king. Now. In the end, it wasn't Obi-Wan's power that beat Anakin, it was his own arrogance that beat him. Kind of just like Maul, you know the story. Now, to have someone twice as powerful as the Emperor would mean that he'd be a very powerful entity in Star Wars. By far the most powerful that has ever lived. At this point, he'd be able to shoot Force Lightning because he'd still have his hands, and he'd literally be able to incinerate enemies to ash instantly. He'd probably be able to jump or kind of fly for extended periods of time, he'd deflect just about any Force attack out there, and he'd heal himself through force drain. This means basically he'd take the life of other life forms and just suck it out of them and put it into himself, healing himself and making him somewhat immortal. Now, one of the main things that Anakin would have developed would have been his ability to see into the future. This was Anakin's greatest gift and the one that he lost on Mustafar after Obi-Wan dealt him the cards that he'd be left with forever. I'd like to go more into detail on just how powerful he'd be and all of his force abilities that we'd have gotten if he didn't fail to Obi-Wan. But for this video, I think explaining George's thoughts on just how powerful Anakin would have been was important to clarify. So that's it for this video guys, I want you to write down in the comments how powerful you think full power Anakin would be if he didn't burn and lose all of his limbs. And then we can get onto that for another video. Hey guys, how's it going and welcome to another Top 10. Today we're going to go over one of my favorite characters of all time, Anakin Skywalker. The Chosen One. Now, Anakin's got tons of information, canon and legends out there, so you can imagine really this list could be, you know, a top 1,000 facts about Anakin, but I'm just going to keep it short and I'm going to keep only 10 here, and I'm just going to pick some random cool things, so I could even make it part 2 of this, so before I digress further, let's get on with the video. Number 1. Anakin's visions destroyed him. One of the questions that arise from Anakin's fall to the dark side is if he hadn't had visions of Padme's death, would he have betrayed the Jedi in the first place? He joined the Sith so he could save her life, but in an ironic, tragic twist, it was that very choice that ultimately led to her demise. So, if he hadn't seen the future, would the events that created it have occurred at all? The ability to see into the future was one of Anakin's most powerful and prominent powers. However, you should know that after the events of Mustafar, after he lost to Obi-Wan and officially became Darth Vader, he lost this ability forever. The death of Padme is probably the most well known of his visions, but throughout Anakin's life he was haunted by the future on various occasions, in particular during the Clone Wars, on Mortis, when he encountered an entity that was the embodiment of the dark side of the Force, known as the Sun. 
the powerful Force wielder revealed to Anakin what a dark turn his life would eventually take as Darth Vader. The knowledge of his dark fate twisted his mind, and the vision itself turned him to the dark side. But to restore him to the light, the memory was later wiped clean by another cosmic force entity called the Father. Number two, Anakin was 12 when he built his first lightsaber. One of the most important rites of passage that a Jedi Padawan must pass is constructing their own lightsaber. Anakin joined the order at a later age than normal recruits, but he was a quick study with a uniquely strong connection to the Force. So when he was 12, he built his first lightsaber. In the crystal caves of the planet Ilum, Obi-Wan took Anakin so that his apprentice could make his saber. The young Skywalker went inside the cave, found a spot, and began to meditate. While in his meditation trance, a specter of a slave and another one of Darth Maul appeared and attacked him. But Anakin was able to handle them easily. When he woke from his trance, he had completed his lightsaber. The saber was perfectly balanced for him, with a hilt that was heavy and rigid to complement his strength and would go on to serve the young Jedi well until he lost it in the droid factory on Genosis in Episode 2. Number 3. He could tame beasts with the Force. Some Jedi were able to communicate and or manipulate with non-sentient animals or creatures throughout the galaxy. This included Anakin, who trained in the ability from his earliest days with the Jedi. It proved especially useful for him in the arena on Genosis, when he was able to calm down a ferocious reek and even mount it as his steed. The ability remained with him as a Sith as well. After his injuries on Mustafar as Vader, he would go on various occasions to invade the minds of beasts to be used for his own ends. Number 4. Years before his fall, he nearly left the Jedi. Given that the Jedi Council didn't initially want him to join the Order, Anakin was always a little uncertain about his place with the Jedi, but there was a point years before the Clone Wars that the young Jedi actually decided to leave. His doubts were only heightened when he developed a friendship with Chancellor Palpatine, whose influence began to push him away from the Jedi. He started to wonder whether he was on the right path in his life. He joined the Order as a child and hadn't really made an informed choice. His doubts only grew over time, until he reached the point where he handed over his lightsaber to Obi-Wan Kenobi, having decided to leave the Jedi, as we can see in this old Anakin and Obi-Wan comic. However, a crucial mission interfered in his plans. He had to cast his doubts and uncertainties aside and focus on the important tasks at hand. Throughout that adventure, Anakin eventually changed his mind and made his own choice to remain with the Jedi, much to Obi-Wan's relief, and later, great regret. But yeah. What would have happened if Anakin had left the Order before the Clone Wars? That's uh, fan fiction for another time. Number 5. Anakin's robes reflected his personality. Now, I've made a video on this by itself a couple years ago, but I'm going to reiterate and dive into a little more here. Anakin always stood apart from the other Jedi. We know this. He joined them at an older age. His power was unrivaled besting every other student and even some teachers. His attitude was unconventional and he would at times disobey orders and improvise during dangerous situations, usually to very successful outcomes. But his masters and other teachers found him reckless. You can argue that he liked making these little subtle, at times not so subtle, rebellious acts against the Order. Even his robes were a bit of a middle finger to the Jedi. They were a darker shade of brown than what most Jedi usually wore. They also incorporated a synthetic black leather surcoat. The black color was probably a fashion choice, but the material itself offered greater protection than traditional cloth, like Obi-Wan's. This came in handy for a man of action type like Anakin, as he would at times jump into situations before stopping to think them through. The robes actually supplied some protection against possible reckless lightsaber strikes, as they were dense and provided armor. Though the outfit, of course, didn't reflect lightsaber strikes, it merely gave him a bit better of a protection and feel. The outfit did have its practical uses, though. The Jedi were still a bit concerned with the obvious rebellious choices Anakin had made in the aesthetics of his robes. Concerns that, as it turned out, they should have taken more seriously. Number 6. Inspiration Authors on occasion, when they are trying to come up with a name for their characters, sometimes find inspiration from historical figures. That doesn't really appear to be the case with George Lucas, however, who seemed to have searched for cool sounding names that reflected his character's function. Like Luke's last name was originally Starkiller, but was changed to Skywalker and he is a Jedi and symbolically walks in the sky compared to ordinary beings. With Han's last name too, 
Solo was picked only because the character was a loner that lived by his own rules, as we saw in the Solo film. Though it hasn't been confirmed by Lucas, it is possible that the name Anakin might have a historical origin as well. There were allegedly giants called Anakim, who were creatures in the vein of Goliath from David and Goliath living in Palestine. They apparently reigned supreme and favored war above most things, so perhaps Anakin was supposed to be the more aggressive name, and Luke could have been David to Anakin's Goliath. Number seven, Anakin almost became a slave again. When we met Anakin in The Phantom Menace, he was a slave, which even after he was freed, was something that haunted him the rest of his life. He resented anyone who was involved in the horrendous trade. So, when during a mission in the Clone Wars, Anakin, Obi-Wan, and Ahsoka ended up in bondage. The former slave was probably dealing with one of the most difficult moments for him in the war. In order to rescue Togrutan colonists, who had been kidnapped by Zygerian slavers, Anakin, Obi-Wan, and Ahsoka posed as slavers to get their queen's favor. But she figured out who they were, and Anakin was forced to serve the queen as her personal slave. Because his friends' lives were in danger, he obeyed her for a time. Eventually, he devised a plan to escape at the right moment, while the queen had to face the wrath of Count Dooku. Only a slave again briefly, he and Ahsoka promised to free the galaxy of slavery after the Clone Wars. Of course, it could be argued that Anakin was a slave his whole life. On Tatooine, in bondage, he had a master, and then as a Jedi, he had masters. As a Sith Lord, he had one master. Anakin Skywalker, Darth Vader, was never free to be his own man, if you really think about it. He always had to answer to someone else. Number eight, he trained Saw Gerrera. The breathing impeded extremist in the cumbersome suit, Saw Gerrera, who was played by Forrest Whitaker in Rogue One and voiced by Andrew Kishino in the Clone Wars animated show, was a resistance fighter who hated the Separatists and the Empire and fought them both with fanatic zeal and determination. During the Clone Wars, Anakin, Obi-Wan, and Ahsoka trained Guerrera and his people in how to wage guerrilla warfare against the Separatist forces. Training which he would later employ with great efficiency against the Empire, and to some degree would be adopted by the Rebel Alliance, meaning Darth Vader had to fight against the tactics of Anakin Skywalker. Number 9. How He Got the First Scar on His Face Between Attack of the Clones and Episode 3, Revenge of the Sith, Anakin grew out his hair, grew out exponentially in power and ability, and suddenly had a mysteriously cool looking scar over his right eye. How did he get it? Well, in Legends, at least Anakin was on Coruscant, in the lower levels listening to a recording Padme had left for him, when he was suddenly attacked by Count Dooku's deadly apprentice, Asajj Ventress. She managed to taunt and antagonize the Jedi enough that his temper left him momentarily open for her to carve the scar into his face with one of her lightsabers. But she soon enough withdrew from the duel as she knew she couldn't beat him, though she didn't let on. Instead, she left with the boast that she could have ended him whenever she wanted, but had chosen not to. Number 10, Anakin's midichlorian count. One of the more controversial additions George Lucas added to Star Wars lore with the prequel films was the concept of midichlorians. Personally, I liked it, I was fine with it, but I know a lot of people had issues with it. They were Lucas's semi-scientific explanation of how the Force works, where before, the Force had been more of a spiritual, mysterious galactic energy, and I feel like they still are, however, this was George's scientific way of trying to explain it. I'm not gonna get into whether the addition was a good or bad thing, either way, they're canon. A Force sensitive can sense the strength of the Force in other beings, but to understand their potential, a count of their midichlorians is made. If the Jedi lived in a video game, you can say that the midichlorians are a type of stat level, with Anakin Skywalker having the highest number of any Force user in the history of the Jedi. His count was over 20,000, with even some sources citing it at over 27,000. What he could have become at full potential remains unknown, but it's clear he would have become something incredible, as even with a crippled, burnt body, he had no equals. What's going on guys? So in today's video, I wanna talk about something I think might be interesting for those who don't know the answer. Now, we all know that Anakin was the chosen one. He had midichlorians higher than Yoda when he was just a boy and you know, so on and so forth. Palpatine saw this. He manipulated him for almost 10 years with extreme patience. It's no surprise that once he saw him laying there in Mustafar burnt to a crisp and limbless, he was crushed and had no use for him anymore. Now before his loss to Kenobi, Sidious told Yoda during their duel that Vader will become more powerful than either of them. This was true. He was destined to overpower every Jedi in the galaxy. Now, 
The answer to this is Anakin, or rather Vader, after his loss to Obi-Wan, lost over 20% of his total power. How did I get this number? George Lucas in many interviews has said himself that Vader was only at 80% of his full power after Mustafar at his potential, compared to Sidious, which means that he would have been even more powerful than that. Now that's one-fifth of his power gone. Can you imagine what he'd be like at full power? I'm now going to say a quote from the Revenge of the Sith Jr. novelization where Sidious on Mustafar walks right up to Anakin and gives us a piece of his thoughts about everything that happened and why Anakin won't be as powerful as before. No, it can't be, but it was. His promising new apprentice, who was to be the greatest Sith who'd ever lived, maimed and burned, perhaps dead. Darth Sidious ground his teeth in frustrated anger. Part of him wanted to turn on his heel and leave what was left of Darth Vader to burn to ashes in the rising lava. Even if he was alive, even if he could be saved, Vader would be crippled. And not just with his mechanical limbs. The Force, dark side as well as light, was generated by living beings, and it took living flesh to manipulate it. Darth Vader would never be able to cast blue force lightning. That required living hands, not metal ones. And with so much of his body replaced by machinery, he would never come close to the potential that he'd had. It was a great pity, Darth Sidious thought, controlling his anger, but perhaps not irreparable. Even diminished, Darth Vader would still be very strong, and there were no Jedi left to challenge him. Darth Sidious had seen to that himself. So he kept walking until he could bend over the body. And to his surprise, his apprentice was still alive. So first off, we gotta think like Sidious would for a moment. He pretty much executed the majority of Jedi in the galaxy with Order 66, and those who he missed were too afraid and outnumbered to come out of hiding. This would make the galaxy much more safe from the Jedi than anything, from his point of view at least. So from here, a burnt and weaker Anakin was still an extremely powerful Vader. He was the best option from what was around. However, this was the moment that sparked Sidious in looking for a newer, younger, more powerful apprentice. That's why, all throughout the comics, he tries to find new ones or new ways to test Vader. Then, when the son of Skywalker came along, with all of his power and the Skywalker bloodline running through his veins, he was like, yep, he's my next apprentice, 100%. And if he will not be turned, then he will die. And you know what? It almost worked too, as we all saw. But if Luke didn't see Vader's chopped off hand, connecting it back to his own and realizing, whoa, down this path is only one outcome, then the Star Wars galaxy would have been very different today. Now, I want to make a video covering just how powerful Darkseid Anakin would have been if he didn't lose to Obi-Wan. I think that'd be a fun one for sure to have theories on. So at a 20% loss, that's the Vader that we saw, which was still extremely powerful and struck so much fear into the entire galaxy. So I wonder what a full power Vader would be like. Let me know what you guys think of Anakin's lost potential and what kind of powers that he'd have developed so I can cover them in the next video. Hey everyone and welcome to today's new video. So, I hope you're all having an awesome day. I want to talk about something that I always wanted to talk about with you guys. One of the biggest stigmas out there is that Hayden Christensen was the worst actor to choose for Anakin Skywalker's role. Now, I made this post on Twitter and Instagram yesterday about it, but I'd like to make a video today going over my thoughts on it in full. Now, Hayden played Anakin in episodes two and three. The majority of people hated the character, and even George has gone on to say this. For Hayden, his performance is great, they just don't like the character. Now, while all that might be true, many people didn't like his acting because they said he was too whiny, monotone, and lacks emotion. While I fully agree with all of you there, I'm also here to address just why he was the perfect fit. George went through Anakin's story with Hayden the entire time. From pre-production to post-production, Hayden knew the character inside and out. He knew who he'd turn into and who he had to start out as. Let's take Anakin as if he were a real human in today's world. You know what? Rather, let's make it personal. Anakin is you. You are Anakin. So let's begin. You're born without a father figure. Your mom and you have to survive being slaves by the huts and then some disgusting flying creature that whips you and beats you until you're black and blue. Seriously, that happened in the books and comics to Anakin all the time. You grow up seeing your mom treated like garbage and you can't do anything about it because you're just a little boy who's also a slave and has to do anything for the hand that feeds him. This kind of gives you a complex growing up wouldn't you think? The only thing you have is building things. You like to do that in your own downtime, and really robots are your only friend anyways. Some magical wizard comes along with this beautiful looking girl and whisks you away to a life of being a space wizard, where you can move stuff with your mind and help people because after living in a life of poverty and torture your whole life, all you just want to do is have justice for yourself, your mom, and the people around you. You know, as much as you can. 
So you leave your mom in slavery on this terrible planet. You train, you realize that you're more powerful than everyone in your class, even some of your teachers. Yet they don't advance you. They keep you in the same grade when you clearly can move forwards. You get your first mission finally, almost 10 years later, with the only woman you've had a crush on. Yet you are forbidden to act on your feelings for her. You have to be like a machine, cold, numb, and monotone. That's the way that they've raised you to be. You keep having these visions of your mother dying, and then you eventually fail in saving her because you were forced to be on this mission. When you mentioned it countless times to your master, who really wasn't supposed to be your master in the first place, but only is because the real one died, and you got pawned off to his student, who definitely wasn't ready for an apprentice of his own. He disregards your thoughts on your mother whenever you mention it, and tells you to focus on the moment. You witness her death, she being tortured by faceless monsters in the desert on the planet you were a slave your whole life. You promised to become powerful and come back to save her, but they held you back. Your master ignored your warnings about her being in danger, and now you have to bury her. You fight the guy responsible for all the turmoil in the galaxy who betrayed the faction, the Jedi, you were brainwashed to obey. Simultaneously, he's the same guy your original master was trained by, so you already have some strange resentment towards him. And then he cuts your arm off. You get married in secret, then spend the next few years being a war hero above all the others for the Clone Wars. You kill the guy who took your arm, then immediately find out you're having a baby with your wife. This is kind of a double or triple whammy. The Jedi can't know that you're with anyone romantically. You can't be married, and you definitely can't be having a child. How will all of this be hidden? How will that be answered when people ask her about it? Will she have to have a fake husband? How will that work? This entire time since you've become a space wizard, I guess we could say, you've been manipulated by this old man who's the closest thing to an uncle to you, Palpatine or maybe even like a father. You have dreams of your wife dying in childbirth constantly. Now this uncle figure says that there's a way to save people from dying, but not through the Jedi, who you've trusted your whole life. But you're now starting to doubt a little bit with their actions and their over-involvement with politics. You're now probably the most conflicted you've ever been in your whole life. You already lost your mom because you were held back all those years when you could have been developing your powers further to maybe give you more insight a lot earlier or save those from death sooner. Your mind now begins to point fingers at everyone, all in anger and desperation. You're moody, you're stressed out, you're not sleeping, you're not eating, you're not respected the way you should be by anyone here, especially those below you. But yet, you keep your cool by being callous, numb, monotone, like a machine, like a ticking time bomb. You're given a seat on the council. What an honor, but you're denied the rank of master. This has never been done in history. Not only is that outrageous and unfair, but it would have granted you access to the restricted section that only masters have access to. Perhaps this would have led you to learning how to save your wife from dying, preventing you from turning to the dark side and pledging your allegiance to the Sith and your new uncle. The dreams won't stop either. You find out your uncle father figure is behind all of this and that he's the most powerful and evil guy in the universe. He was even behind the guy that chopped off your arm in the first place. You tell the guy who has always doubted you, always given you a hard time, and always felt like you didn't deserve your powers. Not to mention, he denied you the rank you deserve. He says go sit and wait for us big boys to take care of business. You sit, you think, you cry because you can't really do anything else with all of these pent up emotions that you've had for years and years on end. And in response to losing the only person who promised to treat you with the power and respect that you deserve, you run to see what's going on. You're caught in between the guy that has always disliked you and the uncle father figure who promised to save your wife. In a split second decision, without thinking, purely on emotion, it's about you saving your wife or saving the guy who has always been mean to you. You choose your wife. There's no going back. You're in this life for good. You explode. You kill everyone, including the kids. You're on a power trip. All those years of pent-up emotions and powers that you could never use are now unleashed in a span of just a few hours for the first time in your life. You are sent to kill annoying, evil politicians on a fire planet. You kill them. You see your wife. She wants you to run away and raise your child together. You calm down. You consider it. You look up to think. And what do you see? Your master in the doorway of her ship. Rage. Blind dark rage engulfs you. The next thing you know, she's passed it on the ground, you don't know how, now it's just him in your path. You don't focus on the force, you don't focus on your training, you just unleash. You're winning, he gets the high ground, you have a god complex, you think you can do anything in the galaxy, including beating him the way that he beat the first Sith Lord in a thousand years, which you know all about. This fuels your ego even more, thinking that you are that much better than him, 
and you can beat him at his own move. You try it, and you lose. You then spend the rest of your life in a terrible, agonizing misery of depression, where no one you know is around you anymore, you are hated and feared by the entire galaxy, and you never really can see your face again because you're entombed in this black suit. And everything on you is pretty much burned off. Yeah, everything. What? Hayden knew this was Anakin's life when he read the script for the role. He played the character perfectly. He was the literal definition of a brainwashed soldier. However, the only issue was he was brainwashed only after he spent about a decade in a life of misery and torture with the only family that he had, his mother. Those emotions will mess you up. Eventually, the obedient dog, when mistreated, I don't care how obedient he's trained to be, will respond to nature's calling and bite back. If we take all of this into account, then Hayden did a fantastic job. Watch the prequels again, at least Revenge of the Sith. His entire demeanor is always as if he's processing something, and that's the genius right there. Whether Hayden did this intentionally or not, it's how Anakin should be. Conflicted, he was always conflicted. Luke sensed it in him, even into his older age as Vader. Anakin always had this hate, and it's because of what happened to him as a kid, that's something that only got worse the more he was mistreated and stressed out with all of his complexes that I just mentioned. Also, for those who don't know, Hayden actually paid so much attention to how James Earl Jones sounds as Darth Vader, he would try to pronunciate the same words in the same style of context. Notice how he says the words, my master. He rolls the words together, just like Vader did. He paid very close attention to the role, and I think he did a really good job. I think Anakin is Hayden, and Hayden is Anakin. Maybe there are others who could play his part, sure, but that doesn't mean that he didn't do a great job or that they could do a better one. This is what we got, and I think it lives up to the part. Hey everyone, in today's video, we're gonna take another piece out of the Secrets of the Jedi book, or as you formerly know, the series that I call Luke's Point of View. This one's gonna be short and sweet. It's a little bit interesting, I find, because it talks about Luke and his point of view of not just Vader and not just Anakin, but Anakin within Vader and what really kept him to pursue this belief that he could bring his father outside of the darkness that is Vader. This really makes me think of that scene in Return of the Jedi, so this is what I think Luke is really talking back towards or reminiscing, which is that scene when Vader just captures Luke and he's about to bring him aboard the second Death Star to the Emperor. So there's two parts to this, and I'm going to read the first, but the second part is really the one that we want. It's called Balance to the Force, and I'll announce it when we get to it, so here we go. A hard lesson. I rushed off to play hero, believing myself ready to face Darth Vader on my own. That was the day I learned Vader was my father, and it was the day I lost my hand, as well as my lightsaber, in battle against him on Bespin. I was lucky I didn't pay for my hubris with my life. Though the wounds ran deep, I soon learned that lightsabers and even hands could be rebuilt. As it turned out, so could Death Stars, and as the Empire prepared to use their new battle station to eliminate the Rebel Alliance once and for all, I found myself contemplating the journey my father had taken to the dark side. Balance to the Force. So this is the one we really want to focus on, and before that, I find that pretty interesting as well, because it talks a lot about how Luke basically cut his training short and he knew that he did that. And Point Blank says that he was lucky that he didn't die for his own arrogance, for his own hubris, which is the main reason that Darth Maul lost to Obi-Wan in The Phantom Menace. It was his arrogance and his cockiness that made him believe he could win if he just toyed with his prey, or you know, it just wasn't gonna be a big deal. But of course, that turned into his death. And with Luke, his father was merely toying with him as well. No matter how far my father had fallen, I sensed that his turn to the dark side was not absolute. I knew Anakin Skywalker had followed his heart to a fault during his days as a Jedi. Our ultimate victory would rely on my belief that the same heart was still beating somewhere inside Darth Vader's armor. The Emperor tried to sway me to his side, and when that didn't work, he tried to kill me. But at that moment, my father turned against his own master to protect his son. His final act was to hurl the Emperor to his death, not only redeeming himself, but also, finally, restoring balance to the Force as the prophecy had foretold. Now the main thing you can probably guess that I really like about this is that Luke confirms that Anakin was the chosen one and that he did fulfill the prophecy as was foretold. What I really like about this as well is that it shows just how much hope Luke has. And it shows that no matter what, no matter how evil Vader was, you know, killing children, Order 66, everything that he did, Luke could feel the rage and anger within him and yet 
still chose to believe that there was a little bit of Anakin breathing inside of him. He says that our ultimate victory would rely on my belief that the same heart was still beating somewhere inside Darth Vader's armor. And it also goes to mention that Luke knows that Anakin followed his heart to a fault during his days as a Jedi. So it even kind of emphasizes the fact that Anakin wasn't really all that he did evil things but he wasn't evil to the core he was merely following his heart and sometimes we just follow the wrong path but at the end of the day he followed that same heart to the right path and saved his son fulfilling the prophecy as the chosen one in revenge of the sith we see anakin take his final route to the dark side and fulfill his destiny at the emperor's hand with all his evil actions, such as sacrificing Master Windu, raiding the Jedi Temple, and killing the younglings, it seems unfitting for Anakin to be crying to himself, especially after his eyes turned yellow on Mustafar, symbolizing pure evil and submission to the dark side. Most believe that it was because he was sad about killing the younglings, or for betraying the Jedi. This couldn't be further from the truth. It's unfortunate the movie leaves out so much, whereas the books fill in all the gaps. So, the novelization, as you guessed it, has our answer in full. Our scene takes place just after Anakin murdered all the Separatist leaders on Mustafar, stepping outside to recollect on all that he had done. Our scene begins. After killing all the Separatist leaders, Palpatine's new apprentice had stepped outside the mountain fortress on Mustafar to gaze at the blazing lava rivers below. He would not mourn for the lives he had taken, but for the loss of his former self, the boy who had dreamed of becoming a Jedi. He was unable to hold back the tears that streamed down his cheeks. Anakin Skywalker was gone. Or was he? After all, Padme had fallen in love with Anakin, not Darth Vader. He had not anticipated that Padme, traveling with C-3PO, would follow him to Mustafar and refute the righteousness of his actions, nor had he foreseen that Obi-Wan would survive the Jedi Purge, and that the deceitful Padme would bring him with her. Despite his powers and years of attunement to Obi-Wan, his rage had blocked his ability to sense his former master's presence on Mustafar until he saw the Jedi standing in the hatch of Padme's starship. He also never imagined that Obi-Wan possessed the strength to bring him down so brutally. So this passage is from the rise and fall of Darth Vader. This answers two things for us why Anakin didn't sense Obi-Wan on Padme's ship, but mainly our question regarding his tears. He didn't care so much for what he did to the Jedi. He did indeed dislike them and their dogmatic beliefs, leading me to theorize that he visits Luke in Episode 8 and tells him why he turned away from them and why he saw through the lies of the Jedi, which could be why we hear Luke say it's time for the Jedi to end. It was Anakin's detachment from himself that he began to cry for. A lot of people give Hayden a hard time for his acting. I think if we realize just how difficult it is to act when you're so conflicted, emotionless, depressed, and moody, then we'd see he did a pretty good job, especially in the scenes that are just pure emotion. For the most part, at least. In the novelization, it is stated that Vader recollects his detachment from Anakin was when he raided the Jedi Temple, but it can be seen here with his tears that he truly felt the break between his old self and the new Sith Lord he had become. I've made a somewhat recent video, which I'll have pop up in the last 20 seconds of this one. It outlines just how Anakin and Vader are two entirely different people, and how he and Palpatine saw it this way as well. Anakin was full of hatred. From the moment his mother died, he had a taste for the dark side, and it lingered within his thoughts ever since. That's how he defeated Dooku, and how he lived the rest of his days until he turned into Darth Vader. In one of the Now Legends comics, Obi-Wan witnessed Anakin when he was still a very young Padawan using force fire against an enemy and burnt them to death. This just goes to show the mind frame and power Anakin possessed from a small age. I suspect this is why Ahsoka left the Jedi Order. She saw the flaw in the code and found her own way as a Grey Jedi, which we later see in Rebels. The book also throws a quick fan fiction idea at us. It explains during Vader's thoughts about Mustafar, he wondered what would have happened if he never actually went, or in other words, left with Padme. Come away with me. He then leads to think about himself sitting atop a throne on Coruscant with Padme and his children. That would surely have changed a lot of things. I think it would make for an interesting fanfiction. You can let me know if you want me to do that in the comments below. What do you think of Anakin's crying on Mustafar? Do you think he was ever truly killed off and Vader took over entirely? Or there was always a little sliver of him in there? A grain of sand, if you will.
Hey everyone, hope you're doing well. Thanks for checking out another video. Make sure to check out StarWarsTheory.com and keep blowing up the forums on there. So today we're going to be going over Hayden Christensen explaining his scene after Anakin kills Tusken Raiders. This is probably one of my favorite scenes in all of Star Wars. It really shows Anakin's first step into the dark side and really goes into the psychology of Anakin Skywalker and shows you, if you really think about it, that he's not a bad person. He's just a good person doing bad things out of desperation. We're going to hear from George Lucas. We're going to hear from Hayden Christensen in the book Star Wars Archives by Paul Duncan, 1999 to 2005. So without further ado, let's get on with the interview in the book. Anakin has grown up with no parental influences for the past 10 years of his life. So Obi-Wan has become a father figure for him. He loves him. But at the same time, there is still that resistance because Anakin wants to break free of what he is doing right now, which, I guess, is a theme of all the Star Wars movies. So there is that conflict and animosity between the characters when Obi-Wan won't let him make his own choices. Obi-Wan is the master and I am the Padawan learner, so there are certain things that I can pick up from Ewan because he's already been in my shoes, so to speak. I look at the way he carries himself on set and the way he relates to his surroundings. There are certain mannerisms the Jedi have because they are confident. They also stand on guard, and there is a physicality to them since they are protectors. Hayden goes on to say, This film is mostly a love story particularly for my character. When Anakin is introduced in the film, he sees Padme for the first time in 10 years, and that was a very childlike desire and attraction and affection that turns into a much more passionate love. Maybe that frightens Padme a little bit. Yoda predicted that Anakin should not be trained because he has such a strong connection to his mother and would miss his mom. So there's a fear of and longing for love, knowing that it's not going to be there. What's Yoda's line? Fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. The crucial turning point of the dark side is when his mother dies. In this scene, in the garage, I've just gotten back from the Tusken Raider camp, and that's my big breakdown, when I confess to all the men women and children that I've just slaughtered in my supreme anger. Anakin has that feeling of failure. His most prominent goal in life was to free his mom, and he failed. So even though he is destined to be the most powerful Jedi, there's that longing for a greater power, which the dark side possesses. That's seductive. He wants to be able to stop people from dying, so he'll stop at nothing to be as aggressive as he needs to achieve that. So before we get on to George's final take on this scene, uh, which is one of my favorite scenes, I really feel like Hayden really understands Anakin's story and arc, and this was explained to him properly by George Lucas, of course because he wrote it. But this is something that a lot of people don't see with Anakin, is that he wasn't just some psycho that wanted to go insane. He was just seduced into the dark side. For over 10 years of his life, Palpatine was seducing him and pulling these strings like a little puppet. And every time the Jedi Council made Anakin mad or didn't give him what he wanted or what he needed to save his mother, and in the end big things happened and changed Anakin's life for the worse, like his mother dying, he blamed the Jedi. And of course, Palpatine was right there to pat him on the back and say, well, you ever heard the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise? You know, things like that to kind of just lead his mind a little bit that there are other ways to learn what you want to learn. You must not have such a dogmatic view of the Force like the Jedi do. There are other pathways to learn the powers you need to stop your wife from dying or to stop people from dying or to reach your potential that you want, that they're holding you back, that they don't trust you. All these little things. I need your help, son. And so Hayden really puts it nicely where he says that Anakin will stop at nothing to be as aggressive as he needs. It's like fighting to stop war. <laughs> You know what I mean? It's that you're doing basically the inverse of what you're trying not to do. You're doing what you shouldn't be doing. You're doing what you're trying to stop from happening. So Anakin kills in order to save life. It's such a weird oxymoron in that sense. And I feel that Hayden really understands where this character is coming from, that this character in itself is so unbelievably confused that he's seduced into this and he wants to be able to stop people from dying so he stops at nothing to be as aggressive as he needs to be in order to make sure that happens because the Jedi sure as hell aren't teaching him what he wants to know. So now he kind of has to take it into his own hands and make sure that that aggression is applied to really sink his teeth into having this power otherwise it's going to be too late and people will die. People that he cares for. And that is the tragedy 
of Anakin Skywalker, the tragedy of Darth Vader. George Lucas goes on to say, Anakin's flaws, like all classic mythological heroes, are the flaws that everybody carries with them. He's struggling with the same issues that everybody struggles with, and that allows him to be human. A good Jedi overcomes those flaws. So this is exactly what Obi-Wan actually overcame. He saw all of the darkness with Order 66 and blamed himself for decades on what had happened to the entire galaxy and to his friends and to his, his brother, to Anakin, you know? And what happened to his master. And He blamed everything on the dark side. And he felt he was responsible in a way for everything. I mean, he, he saw his master die before him. He killed his own Padawan. He saw the love of his life die before his eyes at the hands of his arch nemesis, his enemy in front of him, who he had already thought he killed, who had killed his master. I mean, Obi-Wan's gone through the most pain in Star Wars, I think, than anybody next to Anakin Skywalker. I don't think there is another character that has witnessed more pain and gone through more of a character arc than Anakin and Obi-Wan. And you see, this is the interesting part. If Qui-Gon was alive, Anakin would have succeeded where Obi-Wan had failed him. And where Obi-Wan succeeded in seeing that a Jedi overcomes these flaws is where Anakin failed as a Jedi. At least until he brought balance back to the Force, of course, and, you know, killed Palpatine with the help of Luke, who acted as a catalyst. But it's these very interesting lessons that kind of help you understand Anakin, these these interesting backstories from the behind-the-scenes books and novels and things like that, and these interviews that really help you know the character arc that is the tragedy of Darth Vader. Because without it, you just kind of see a, a psycho guy, and I feel like it's almost lost in time with these new generations of people coming in and watching Star Wars. Many of them gloss over it, not the ones who are, you know, more diehard. I, I feel like the ones who see it, they just see Anakin as this psychotic being, but he's really a tragic pathetic character. He's just a slave to his emotions and a slave to his thoughts and fears and he's allowing that to essentially drive him and his immense powers to do these terrible things and be as aggressive as he can in order to stop people from dying by killing people. It's just, it's crazy and it should show you what those wrong decisions will lead your life into becoming which is eventually what Luke saw at the very end of episode 6 when he was about to strike down his father and he looked at his mechanical hand and then looked at his father's severed mechanical hand and saw, oh crap, if I keep going, this is what is going to become of my life. I'm going to be just like that. And so he stopped and the rest is history as we know it. So I hope you guys enjoyed this information. Uh, please let me know if you want me to continue with these kind of videos. I absolutely love these along with fan fictions and comics and all that stuff. But these... I feel like these are gems, man. Like, I could talk about Star Wars, you know, anyone can read from a comic book, anyone can read from, you know, parts in the, in the novels and stuff, but if you can really find these tidbits and these gems from George Lucas and the behind the scenes, dude, this is where it's at. This is how you really understand Star Wars and the heart and soul behind this from the creator himself and, of course, from those who acted in his movies because they were directed by him and instructed by him and they had to in order to carry out his story as best as they could. In a recent video I made, I discussed how Vader disassociated himself from Anakin for the first time. This happened on Mustafar, and you guys might remember the video it was just a couple days ago. Now a lot of you asked me to make a video covering everything Anakin did on Mustafar to the Separatists, so that's what this video will cover. I'm going to include a piece from the last video, and then I'm going to continue on it, including everything that he did up until killing Newt Gunray. The book and movie events are completely different. The book offers a much more dark, powerful, and descriptive version of what Anakin did. There are some pretty graphic parts, and I wish they would have showed this in the film because it just shows his ultimate raw power at that moment. But unfortunately, you know, we didn't, and we just get it in the book. So here it is, and then we can talk about it afterwards. As Vader lands down on Mustafar, Palpatine speaks to Newt Gunray, when the question of Lord Vader's arrival has been confirmed. As Sidious promises them a large reward in Vader's hands for them, the transmission ends and Vader walks into the doorway. Sandhill beat the others to the greeting. Welcome, Lord Vader. Now, obviously, this is not Sand Hill. This is Newt Gunray. Things do change in the script, in the book, and the film. So keep that in mind. 
his elongated legs almost tangled with each other in his rush to shake the hand of the Sith Lord. On behalf of the leadership of the Confederacy of Independent Systems, let me be the first to- Very well, you will be the first. The cloaked figure stepped inside and made a gesture with a black gloved hand. Blast doors slammed across every exit. The control panel exploded in a shower of sparking wires. The cloaked figure threw back its hood. Sand Hill recoiled, hands flapping like panicked birds sewn to his wrists. You're, you're Anakin Skywalker! Before a fountain of blue-white plasma burned into his chest, curving through a loop that charred all three of his hearts, the Separatist leadership watched in frozen horror as the corpse of the head of the intergalactic banking clan collapsed like a deep-powered protocol droid. The resemblance, Darth Vader said, is deceptive. Within the Separatist leadership bunker's control center were dozens of combat droids. There were armed and armored guards. There were automated defense systems. There were screams and tears and pleas for mercy. None of them mattered. Poggle the Lesser, Archduke of Genosis, scrambled like an animal through a litter of severed arms and legs and heads, both metal and flesh, whimpering, fluttering his ancient gauzy wings until a bar of lightning flash burned his own head free of his neck. Shumai, president and CEO of the Commerce Guild, hands clasped before her, tears streaming down her shriveled cheeks. We were promised a reward, she gasped. A, a handsome reward. I am your reward, the Sith Lord said. You don't find me handsome? Please, she screeched through her sobbing. Please. The blue white blade cut into and out from her skull and her corpse swayed. A negligent flip of the wrist slashed through her column of neck rings. Her brain burned head tumbled to the floor. The only sound then was a panicky stutter of footfalls as Wat Tambor and the two Nemoidians scampered along a hallway toward a nearby conference room. The Sith Lord was in no hurry to pursue. All the exits from the control center were blast shielded and they were sealed, and he had destroyed the controls. The conference room was, as the expression goes, a dead end. Darth Vader left nothing living behind when he walked from the main room of the control center. Casually, carelessly, he strolled along the hallway, scoring the durasteel wall with the tip of his blade, enjoying the sizzle of disintegrating metal as he had savored the smoke of charred alien flesh. The conference room door was closed, a barrier so paltry would be an insult to the blade. A black-gloved hand made a fist. The door crumpled and fell. The conference room was walled with transparasteel. Beyond, obsidian mountains rained fire upon the land. Rivers of lava embraced the settlement. Rune Hako, aide and confidential secretary to the Viceroy of the Trade Federation, tripped over a chair as he stumbled back. He fell to the floor, shaking like a grub in a frying pan. Wait, is that Anakin using Force Lightning in the concept art? trying to scramble beneath the table. Stop! He cried. Enough! We surrender! Do you understand? You can't just kill us! The Sith Lord smiled. Can't I? We are unarmed! We surrender! Please! Please! You're a Jedi! You fought a war to destroy the Jedi. Vader stood above the shivering Nemoidian, smiling down upon him, then fed him half a meter of plasma. Congratulations on your success. The Sith Lord stepped over Hako's corpse to where Wat Tambor clawed uselessly at the transparasteel wall with his armored gauntlets. The head of the Techno Union turned at his approach, cringing, arms lifted to shield his faceplate from the flames in the dragon's eyes. Please, I'll give you anything, anything you want. The blade flashed twice. Tambor's arms fell to the floor, followed by his head. Thank you. Darth Vader turned to the last living leader of the Confederacy of Independent Systems, Newt Gunray. Viceroy of the Trade Federation stood trembling in an alcove, blood-tinged tears streaming down his green mottled cheeks. The war, he whimpered. The war is over. Lord Sidious promised. He promised we would be left in peace. His transmission was garbled. The blade came up. He promised you would be left in pieces. <laughs> And that is literally the end of everything Anakin did on Mustafar to the Separatists. Now, if this was actually incorporated in the film, it would have gone down in history, just like the rest of the movie. To really see Anakin's full-blooded rage in the film, especially at this moment after its transformation into Darth Vader and harnessing all of the dark side, you know, after killing the younglings and all the Jedi at the temple and betraying his friends, I believe this would have been his possibly darkest moment in the film, at least as Anakin Skywalker still, you know, in human form. This scene, coupled with everything he would have done at the Jedi Temple, would have been my two favorite scenes in the film. However, we only got them in the book, and I hope that this video could have brought some light to it and made you guys realize just how savage and evil 
Anakin had become and how cool I should say you know I mean he just absolutely annihilated everyone. Now as we can see some of Anakin's one-liners were a little bit clunky and funny but that just brings it all back to the prequels and how awesome they were. Hey everyone how are you doing today? Happy Revenge of the Fifth. With the end of the Clone Wars, I figured this would be an interesting video to cover. Now, I will mention at the very beginning that this is Legends. That said, it is written by Matthew Stover, who wrote the Revenge of the Sith novelization. So with that said, let's go forwards. What the Empire told Luke about Anakin's death, or how the Empire said Anakin Skywalker died during Order 66. After Anakin's turn to the dark side at Palpatine's feet, he was deemed as Darth Vader and no longer Anakin Skywalker. His transition into self-hatred was a relatively fast process from his betrayal of Mace Windu, to raiding the Jedi at the temple, killing the younglings and the Separatists, and then finally choking Padme and becoming Darth Vader. Once he wore the suit, he had fully transformed into Vader, and any memory of Anakin was just that, a memory now. So how did the Empire say Anakin Skywalker died? What story did they make up for the Clone Wars hero now that he had become the mysterious Darth Vader, which not many knew about. In the now Legends novel Luke Skywalker and the Shadows of Mindor, it explains the universally acknowledged story of Anakin's demise. This book was composed by Matthew Stover, who also wrote the Revenge of the Sith novelization, so we can assume this is an answer that maybe George accepted as well. I'm going to read a passage from the book where Luke is finally hearing the story which was widely accepted throughout the galaxy about his father. Here we go. Kid, in the Clone Wars, everyone knew him. He was the greatest hero in the galaxy. When he died, it was just like the end of the universe. Nyx got twisted again at the memory. It bloody well was the end of the Republic. Luke stopped. He looked like something hurt. When he died? Nick came to a halt gratefully, bending over with hands on his knees while he tried to catch his breath. Way I heard it, he was the last Jedi standing in the Temple Massacre. When Vader's 500 first went in and killed all the Padawans. What? That's where your father was killed defending children in the Jedi Temple. He was not only the best of the Jedi, he was the last. Nobody ever told you the story? Luke's eyes were closed against some inexpressible pain. That's not the way I heard it. What I find odd and interesting about this is that if this was so widely accepted, seeing as how Nick was surprised Luke never heard the popular story, then why does the Empire shade the clone troopers in such a bad lighting, seeing as how some of them still served in the Empire and were now stormtroopers? Also in the book Patterns of the Force, which I don't consider to be notable at all for our answer, even this one's, even though this one's Legends too, I'll add it here anyways because the information is, eh, it's never bad. Jack's Pavan searches for how Anakin died, whereas most Jedi have complete stories, Anakin's is just one sentence. Jax recalled one of the rumors of where and how Anakin was supposed to have died on Mustafar, thrown into the magma steam, but no one knew by who. Since the first book was written by the same author as a novelization for Revenge of the Sith, for our Legends answer here, I'm gonna accept this as more of an accepted one than just Legends, at least for the George Lucas era. Now with the Clone Wars finale having come to an end, that final scene was one of the most emotional and breathtaking scenes that we've gotten in animation and in Star Wars in general. So I felt this video was fitting to explain and show, at least you know, in this proper Legends information, how the galaxy, or rather how the Empire, made it look like Anakin died. Let me know what you think about the information and if we'll get anything in canon someday. I'd love to know how they change the story and what they'll say about Anakin. Today's video is going to go over the dialogue from the original unrevised script of Revenge of the Sith. You know, I find it always pretty interesting reading this one because you can find so many different things that George was thinking of putting in there. But, you know, with the words of his advisors and his own choices, he decided to later cut it out of the final edit. However, today's will cover the scene where Anakin stands before the council just after speaking to Palpatine, who had unofficially appointed him his personal representative on the council and told him that he must go to Utapau to fight Grievous. Now, personally, I think Palps knew the whole time that the council wouldn't allow Anakin to go, and this was what he was banking on. He knew it would anger him, swaying Anakin's allegiance more towards Palpatine himself, especially after their denial of his mission, and then not granting him the rank of master. So I'm going to read the script for you. He goes before the council, and everyone basically votes for Kenobi to go and kill Grievous. Unanimously, as they all agree, Anakin pipes up to say, The Chancellor has requested that I lead the campaign. They all look at Anakin a bit disturbed. The Council will make up its own mind who is to go, not the Chancellor. Yes, this decision is ours to make. Anakin is embarrassed, becomes sullen. 
A master is needed, one with more experience. Given our resources, I recommend we send only one Jedi, Master Kenobi. He was not so successful the last time he met Grievous. Oh, I don't think so. Obi-Wan throws Anakin a dirty look. No offense, Master, but I'm only stating a fact. Oh no, you're quite right, but I do have the most experience with his ways of combat. Hello there. Obi-Wan, my choice is. I concur. Master Kenobi should go. I agree. All the Jedi concur. Very well. Council is adjourned. Anakin is angry with the decision. Now, I can kind of see why George and Lucasfilm took out this part. It's a bit brash for Anakin to straight up in front of the entire council throw shade at his master. Although, it definitely would have shown more insight into how much he was changing at this time. The extreme internal conflict that was going on within Anakin was pretty much at this point fully baked. He was pretty much ready at this point to transform into Darth Vader. The only thing left was the events that took place in Palpatine's office. Every moment he became more twisted to the dark side by Palpatine's manipulation. In the novel, it's even worse. As Anakin was denied the rank of master, he was talking to himself in his head and thinking about attacking Mace, making fun of his fighting style and mocking him, essentially. Now you see, that's one battle that I wish we saw in the prequels, Anakin fighting Mace. I think that would have been really interesting and entertaining to see, as Anakin wasn't a dark side user just yet, and you see the way Mace's Vapod worked was that he would channel the dark side energy from his opponent back onto them, so he would use that energy and kind of use it as a cycle back onto them to fight them and kill them, so the more powerful his opponent, the more powerful his attacks became. This wouldn't work so well with Anakin because he wasn't fully into the dark side just yet and he would use his Jedi powers. So it would be a bit of a gray area for a fight outcome. I don't really know who would win. Who do you guys think would win in that battle? Let me know your opinions of the original unrevised script of Revenge of the Sith and I will see you all in the next episode of Star Wars Theory. Now, this video might just add some history to, you know, our prequel memes. The high ground, of course, was a huge scene both in episode 3 and, you know, for memes all over the world. But what if I told you guys that in the making of Revenge of the Sith book, there was supposed to be a quip or line that Anakin says right before Obi-Wan warns him of the high ground? It's literally the biggest diss that Anakin could have dished out to Obi-Wan, and hey, you know, I'm actually kind of glad that they took it out because it would have ruined the flow of the whole scene. But the fact that it was written into the script and then taken out at the last minute is something that we should talk about for sure. So during production, George writes up the dialogue between Anakin and Obi-Wan during the duel just before his demise. Anakin was supposed to say, Your combat skills have always been poor. You're called the negotiator because you can't fight. Now, while obviously this is a good zinger to Obi-Wan, it would have totally taken the person out of the movie, I think. Since it's kind of like a high school comeback type of thing and the dialogue just doesn't really fit. I feel like there was too much raw emotion and anger and rage in that scene that speaking about things or maybe making you know a quip or a line kind of just reminds me of lines from the last jedi where poe and hux were making mama jokes and stuff like that it just doesn't really fit now while it's not as bad as that line i still think they took it out for the right reasons now the second part to the diss let's try to break that down why did anakin say this surely the jedi knew obi-wan was a good fighter i mean they sent him to fight general grievous with even mace windu telling him that he was the master of sorsu which was the defense favorite fighting style. Well, and I've mentioned this before, but Obi-Wan was actually the weakest student when he started out. He lacked the most raw power and talent in the whole academy. Everyone knew it, but it was his discipline to make himself as good, if not better, than most other masters. If it took Anakin, let's say, you know, 10 years to learn all that he'd learned from Obi-Wan, then it would have taken Obi-Wan 30 years to learn all of that. Of course, don't quote those numbers or ratio, that's just an example. He was unskilled in the same sense that one might say you know, an athlete of a sport has poor genetics or reflexes or motor controls. However, with practice and patience, Obi-Wan became a great duelist. And that is possibly why he was the master of defense, because just like in his life, being so patient, so was his fighting style, blocking until the opponent faltered out of arrogance or chance, which is when Kenobi would make his final strike. In addition to this, he also adds on another page, walking up to Hayden Christensen, he tells him, basically, you're arrogant. At one point, I had you say to Obi-Wan, I could have beaten you when I was a 10 year old. Now, that's an extremely arrogant thing to say, and I'm fully in agreement with taking that out because I'm sure little Annie from Tatooine couldn't have destroyed Obi-Wan at that age. That line, of course, as George says, was really just to pound it in how arrogant and foolhardy Anakin had become, now with his dark side powers. In a sense, he was always arrogant, it was just seen in little drops here or there. 
I also want to add, in a Legends book, Anakin did set an enemy on fire when he was just a little boy, and that was one of the first times that Obi-Wan was like, whoa, this kid is kind of crazy. So while you guys are now aware of the line we were supposed to get, I'm glad it was taken out to preserve the raw emotion of the scene and to highlight the high ground for all of eternity. I remember the first time I saw the remastered edition of The Return of the Jedi. It was much more crisp and clear, and no doubt it had an overall better quality than the VHS tapes. But that's not the only thing that Lucasfilm changed. The original, as you know, shows this scene of Luke Skywalker after the destruction of the second Death Star, celebrating on the forest moon of Endor with his friends. As he looks out into the distance at Obi-Wan, Yoda, and his father, Anakin Skywalker. It was originally Sebastian Shaw, the same actor we saw at the end of the film, who died in Vader's suit. In the remastered edition, it was changed later to Hayden Christensen from the prequels. As someone who was a little kid when the prequels came into theaters, I got pretty emotional during the scene, to say the least, because it tied together everything so nicely. However, why did they make Anakin young? I'm going to cover another video of why they didn't make Obi-Wan's ghost young, but for now let's just stick to Anakin. The reasoning behind this is fairly simple. It comes from an interview with George, where he touched on this topic personally when asked. He had this to say about it. A Jedi's Force ghost is the image the Jedi had of themselves when they died, and that Anakin died when he became Darth Vader. So right there we can see that Lucas was trying to tie in all the films as closely knit as he could, and by putting young Anakin's head onto old Anakin's body, he was able to do this, at least in his vision. I'm going to also add the novelization in there. The piece is from a snippet when Vader dies and Anakin returns. And for those who didn't know, the return of the Jedi is actually Anakin returning back to the light from Darth Vader. His thoughts were narrated in this piece here. Vader's own sense of anguish to his crimes added guilt at the imagined repugnance of his appearance. But then this brought to mind of the way he used to look, striking and grand, with a wry tilt to his brow that hinted of invincibility and took in all of life with a wink. Yes. That was how he looked once. So Force ghosts are able to manifest their appearance into either themselves or just a voice like Orb floating around. Since this image was the last time Anakin was a Jedi, and from what we know at this point unless changed by Disney, is that only Jedi can become Force ghosts, of course in canon, then it makes sense for Anakin to return in his younger form. Now, my small theory about this is that we know Lucas had relations with Disney for years before they bought the rights, as he even said in interviews. So perhaps they had a little to say in the matter so that they could bring Anakin back in the future, helping with the continuity and to bring more hype to the films. I want to know what you all think. Are you a fan of Hayden showing up as a Force ghost, or would you rather it be the original Sebastian Shaw? So, with most of you wanting me to cover this topic right here, I have to let you know while I was hoping to bring you all a long video with tons of information, sadly there isn't as much as I hoped from just one novel. So what we will cover in this video, however, are from three different novels, and a couple of cutscenes from the PlayStation 2 video game. Revenge of the Sith novelization, The Rise and Fall of Darth Vader, and then The Dark Lord, The Rise of Darth Vader as our third, which covers Vader's thoughts as he remembers what he did at the temple the day that he went back to it. In this way, we get to cover everything that happened at the temple with Anakin and Darth Vader's thoughts. The first passage will be from the Revenge of the Sith novelization, and it will cover the scene where Anakin walks up to the gates. Here we go. Gate Master Jirok sprinted through the empty vaulted hallway, clattering echoes of his footsteps making him sound like a platoon. The main doors of the temple were slowly swinging inward in answer to the code key punched into the outside lock pad. The Gate Master had seen him on the monitor, Anakin Skywalker, alone. The huge doors creaked inward. As soon as they were wide enough for the Gate Master to pass, he slipped through. Anakin stood in the night outside, shoulders hunched, head down against the rain. Anakin, he gasped, running up to the young man. Anakin, what happened? Where are the masters? Anakin looked at him as though he wasn't sure who the gate master was. Where is Shock T? In the meditation chambers, we felt something happen in the force, something awful. She's searching the force in deep meditation, trying to get some feel for what's going on. His words trailed away. Anakin didn't seem to be listening. Something has happened, hasn't it? Drog looked past him now. The night beyond the temple was full of clones. Battalions of them. Brigades. Thousands. Anakin, he said slowly. What's going on? Something's happened. Something horrible. How bad it- The last thing Drog felt was the emitter of a lightsaber against the soft flesh beneath his jaw. The last thing he heard 
A blue plasma chewed upward to his head and burst from the top of his skull and burned away his life. Was Anakin Skywalker's melancholy reply? You have no idea. The second piece now is during Obi-Wan's replay of the recordings. Stone-faced, Obi-Wan watched younglings run into the room, fleeing a storm of blaster fire. He watched Sindrelic and a pair of teenage Padawans. Backing into the scene, blades whirling, cutting down the advancing clone troopers with deflected bolts. He watched a lightsaber blade flick into the shot, cutting down first one Padawan, no! then the other. He watched the brisk stride of a caped figure who hacked through Drellic's shoulder then stood aside as the old troll fell dying to let the rest of the clones blast the children to shreds. Now this third piece is from Darth Vader's memories as he returned to the temple and his thoughts about the younglings. In his mind's eye, Vader saw his and the 501st march to the temple gates. Their wrathful attack, the mad moments of bloodlust, the dark side unleashed in all its crimson fury. Some moments he remembered more clearly than others, pitting his blade against that of Swordmaster Sindrelic beheading some of the very masters who had instructed him in the ways of the Force and, of course, his cold extermination of the younglings and with them, the future of the Jedi Order. He had wondered beforehand, could he do it? Still new to the dark side, would he be able to call upon his powers to guide his hand and lightsaber? In answer, the dark side had whispered, they are only orphans. They are without family or friends. There is nothing that can be done with them they are better off dead. This fourth piece is a cutscene from the PlayStation 2 game where Anakin barges into the Jedi archives. I want access to the temple signal beacon. On whose authority? By order of the Supreme Chancellor. That is not within the Chancellor's power. Only the Jedi Council can authorize access. <laughs> The Council is no longer in control. You won't get away with this, Skywalker! Now this extra bonus piece that I'm going to add in is a deleted scene from the film that didn't get properly edited. It's where Anakin first enters to kill Shakti while she meditates, as Jurok explained. I'll give it some sound effects and music as it originally doesn't have any, just to bring it to life a little bit. So, as we can see, Anakin was extremely ruthless during this time. He felt a great deal of hatred for the Jedi, and his path down the dark side started with the sacrifice of Mace Windu. From there, he felt the Jedi would never forgive him for what he had done, and basically said, well, it's all going bad from here, so might as well just turn to the dark side and get the knowledge to save Padme out of it. I'll make a video later on explaining his thoughts while turning to the dark side and his main reasons for it. I wish they would make a single movie about everything that happened during the Jedi Purge in detail. I think it would give such a better understanding of Anakin's psychology, his depression, and Darth Vader's turn as a whole. I think it would be extremely entertaining to watch. Once Anakin got his first real taste of the dark side, when his mother was tortured and beaten by the Sand People, he took his first step into a much larger world. In Revenge of the Sith, Anakin turns to the dark side at the manipulation of Palpatine the only father figure he ever had. Once his transformation into Darth Vader was complete, Anakin betrayed all the Jedi at the temple, then murdered the Separatists on Mustafar at his new master's commands. Only now would he have committed enough dark deeds to unlock his new powers in the dark side to save Padme. Throughout the sequel trilogy, we see Anakin always take over Obi-Wan's failed jobs and do them better while still being a Padawan. Obi-Wan was one of the least Force-attuned Jedi at the temple. It was his perseverance to study that made him as good as he was, but as for natural talent, he had very little. Anakin, on the other hand, was the chosen one. He had more midichlorians than Master Yoda, and his powers exponentially increased with each year. How could he have lost to Obi-Wan? In this video, we will go over their fighting styles, personality traits, and dueling psychology to better understand exactly why Anakin could have lost. It's very easy to say because he was arrogant, or Obi-Wan had the high ground, but there's much more to it than that. Once Obi-Wan and Anakin began to duel, we were given one of the most cinematic and emotional duels in the prequel trilogy, maybe even the entire saga, some might say. 
As the fight progresses, we can see Anakin is the aggressor, having attacked first and always pushing Obi-Wan backwards, continuously on the aggressive offense as he looks for any opening against his master. In the comics and legends, Anakin and Obi-Wan have fought one another in training thousands of times for practice. That's what made this duel even more difficult. They knew each other's moves better than anyone. Only this time, it was real. Kenobi studied Form 3. This is why he failed against Dooku so many times, because Form 3 always works on the defense. It never presses forwards, rather waits until the opponent either tries or makes a mistake to launch their finishing strike. Having trained with Master Windu himself many times, he told Obi-Wan that he was the master of Sorsu, meaning no one could rival him in the art. This is why the Council sent him to defeat Grievous, because his art form was perfected and they knew this would be of use against the General's Four Limbs. Anakin was younger, stronger, used the dark side, and had an overpowered mechanical hand. He had studied Form 5 Dem So, which is characterized by power attacks and defense immediately followed by a counter-strike. He continuously pushed Obi-Wan back, and we can see this when he fought Dooku as well. His attacks were so powerful in conjunction with his dominant footwork that he always pressed his opponents backwards, and this can be seen through his mentality as well. Always looking to the next thing, continuously wanting more and pressing forwards with his thoughts, fears, and doubts, instead of collectively thinking for a minute. He was brash, and Obi-Wan knew this. This leads us to the cinematic scene just before we all know what happens. Anakin could have waited for the robot to move down the river, then ran at Obi-Wan from a somewhat parallel direction, but he was too arrogant for that. He wanted to kill his master to prove that his new powers were worth his betrayal. Anakin had heard the story of Darth Maul and the way Obi-Wan defeated him many times, and he tried to mimic this in their duel. Whereas Obi-Wan was constantly trying to tell Anakin to stop and to listen to him how the Chancellor was evil. Now, the worst thing that Obi-Wan could have done here was to tell an already enraged Anakin to not do something. Don't try it! Anakin wanted to show his might, that he was now the master, the more powerful one, that he could beat Obi-Wan even with the disadvantage of jumping over him from the low ground. And so, he did. <laughs> The next bit that I'm going to read is from the novelization, and it covers more detail about Obi-Wan's finishing strike. Perched on a rise above the Lava River, Kenobi warned Vader not to attack, but the Sith Lord ignored him, blinded by arrogance and rage. As Vader leapt at Kenobi, blade angled for the kill, he left himself open, allowing Kenobi to execute a vicious Mu'Kai finishing move, dismembering Vader with one swift strike. Vader's left arm and both of his legs were severed, Dropping his lightsaber, Vader rolled to the brink of the Lava River. So, even though Anakin was more talented, physically stronger, and had more powers of the dark side, it was no match for his own arrogance and brash decisions. If the fight had never moved to the high ground, then I think Anakin would still have won, eventually, once Obi-Wan grew tired, just as Qui-Gon did against Maul. <laughs> Now, my fellow Jedi and Sith friends, what did you think of the duel in general? Did you like it? Do you think the high ground idea by the writers was kind of lame? Or do you think that Anakin really couldn't have made that jump? So, something I always wondered, why didn't Anakin have a green lightsaber? Well, the answer is because in A New Hope, Obi-Wan pulled out a blue one, so George had to keep the continuity. Thanks for watching everyone, oh no, I'm just kidding again. In Star Wars, before Disney bought the rights, the old canon, or now legends, is what we knew best. Where lightsabers were indicative of a Force user's favorited and most gifted power. With Jedi Guardians using blue, Force users using green, and evil having red synthetic ones. You could find the canon answer to all the colors in this video that I made a few weeks ago if you ever were curious to know. Now, before all this new canon, George Lucas created that world that we know and love today. So with the rules for lightsaber colors being mentioned, why didn't Anakin have a green one? This could be seen as confusing since he was literally created by the Force. In fact, he was known to be one of the most potentially powerful Force users in all of the known galaxy. And I say known because now we have Snoke. So it would only make sense for him to have a green one, just as Qui-Gon did and as Yoda did. Well, Anakin just isn't all about the use of the Force. First off, 
he was in the Guardian class, still not a Jedi Master to have mastered all of his skills in every aspect of the Force, reaching at least the early stages of his potential. He was still very much a learner, despite being a knight. The second reason is because he was much too focused on becoming the best duelist and physical practitioner. Instead of practicing his Force abilities and furthering his knowledge mentally, we can see proof of this throughout the canon comics where he is constantly dueling a droid simulated as Darth Maul, always trying to beat Obi-Wan. Now, Yoda was always meditating, focusing on the tremors of the Force, opening up his clairvoyance who put his focus more on unveiling the mysteries of the Force itself. Now, green lightsaber users can be classified as the Consular class. To add to this, in Revenge of the Sith, we can see Anakin and Obi-Wan at a stalemate with the use of the Force. Now, even though Obi-Wan has trained almost one and a half times Anakin in terms of years, they were still quite equally matched when it came to the use of the Force, as we can see here. It has been noted that Obi-Wan was the least gifted with the use of the Force, naturally. However, it was his persistence and dedication to being the best that he could be that allowed him to reach the level that he did. Mind you, this is with extreme training that he put himself under, otherwise his Force attunement was extremely poor when he started at the temple. This just goes to show that Anakin was already at this level at a younger age, and without even caring much about using the Force, focusing more on his physical abilities rather than his telekinetic was the issue here. Also, in the Revenge of the Sith novel, it was said that Anakin used the Force to move the giant balcony that Dooku threw on Kenobi, so we can just see indeed he was very powerful with the Force, despite his limited training and care for it. Just, you know, not nearly as strong as he became later on in life as Darth Vader when he really needed to use it and began to advance his Force powers finally. Therefore, Anakin received a blue crystal as is symbolic of his Jedi Guardian status. Now, if the new canon rules were in charge from the beginning, then I do believe that Anakin's lightsaber would have turned green sometime in Revenge of the Sith after the Clone Wars, and then red once he killed the younglings, especially once his eyes turned that Sith yellow and orange. I do wonder if Disney will come out with a new Blu-ray edition where the color of all the lightsabers are changed to how they want and how the new canon is outlined. I mean, just imagine if Anakin is fighting Obi-Wan with a red lightsaber on Mustafar. It would be pretty cool, and I believe there's a video of this out there somewhere on YouTube. I've seen it before. This would open up a completely separate side story for Obi-Wan to turn the lightsaber back to blue before he gives it to Luke in A New Hope. I wonder if we're going to see more tinkering of this lightsaber in the Obi-Wan anthology film. Hey guys, how are you all doing today? So, a common question or comment that I see a lot in the comment section of videos and Instagram, whatever, is where is Anakin during all of the stuff in the Clone Wars? So we've gotten the, you know, the Bad Batch, which we barely got Anakin in there, just a little bit near the end of that arc. And then we got Ahsoka's arc, which didn't have Anakin in it really at all, except for that one little scene. So a lot of the questions revolve around where's Anakin, we want more Anakin, and I believe me, I'm one of the biggest Anakin fans out there, but we need more backstory and story building for these other characters and then we'll get more Anakin. Now the reason I think, this is my theory, this whole video is a theory video, why we're not getting much Anakin in this compared to the other seasons of the Clone Wars is because all of these events are taking place during Revenge of the Sith, which I think is really cool because while we get to build on Ahsoka's character, it ties into all of Revenge of the Sith and shows us that we don't really need to keep up with Anakin's story at this time because we've already seen it because, well, we have it in Episode 3. So. They're doing this thing, at least in my opinion, and I could be totally wrong, which during all of this stuff is the start of episode 3. So I think now that Ahsoka is going to Mandalore, this is when Anakin is just about to kill Dooku. So I'm thinking that him and Obi-Wan have to decide whether they're going to go and kill Dooku or they're going to go to Mandalore and help Ahsoka defeat Maul, if they have any intel on it. And if they don't, well, they're continuing with the original plan anyways. But these are my thoughts on where I think the story is about to go, and once we end up in Mandalore, then we might start actually seeing some bits with Anakin here and there, because it'll carry into parts of Revenge of the Sith. Now, if you remember in one of the trailers for The Clone Wars Season 7, we got this scene right here, which shows the Jedi Council speaking to each other right before Palpatine reveals to Anakin that he is a Sith Lord. This scene right here... To destroy the Jedi. I sense a plot to destroy the Jedi. That is right here from Revenge of the Sith. And this is a mirroring scene of the actual film. So this happened in the film. So I'm thinking 
we're really going fast. If if we're about there, we only have about four episodes left, 9, 10, 11, 12, then we really must be getting close to Order 66 because there isn't much time for us to get to that scene. So now that I'm thinking about it while making this video, when Ahsoka goes to Mandalore, maybe Obi-Wan has already just about killed Grievous, or at least been sent to Utapau. Now, how Rex comes into contact with Ahsoka, I have no idea. Maybe the Jedi figure out that Maul is on Mandalore and they go there. I don't really know. Maybe the Pikes send out, you know, some assassins to get to the Jedi or something because they think, you know, Ahsoka was part of it. And the Jedi get wind of what really happened, and then they figure it all out and go from there. So in short, the reason I think we're not getting much Anakin right now is because we have his story in Revenge of the Sith, and in the timeline, this is all taking place at the same time. So while Anakin, you know, is killing Dooku, Ahsoka is doing her missions with Rafa and Trace. While Ahsoka is going to Mandalore and fighting Maul, Anakin is learning that Palpatine is a Sith Lord, and then so on and so forth. I'm really excited to see how this all melds together because, as I said, we really have only four episodes left. And I know a lot of people have said, oh, okay, this feels like, you know, it should be a 30-episode season. And while I'd love that, of course, that's not the case. We only get 12. Now, I think some of the episodes with Rafa and Trace could have been, eh, sped up a little bit or, you know, maybe even discarded entirely. But we have to remember that those all came at the sacrifice of building Ahsoka's story and who she really is turning into now. So if we're aware of that and we know that this is all for the greater good for Ahsoka's story, then I think a lot of us will be more in terms with what's going down. So this is my theory on why we haven't seen much Anakin in the Clone Wars as of yet. I think that's about to change very quickly and I really hope we get to go into Order 66 and see a lot of the things that we never got to see before in the temple. Hey everyone, hope you're having a nice day so far. In Labyrinth of Evil by James Luceno, Having tracked Count Dooku to the Outer Rim world of Tithe, shortly before the beginning of Revenge of the Sith, Anakin Skywalker, in a moment of uncontrollable anger, unleashes the dark side, bringing down an entire dome on top of Obi-Wan and himself. So now I'm going to read the excerpt from chapter 41, which goes over this moment where Anakin displays this power. And then we're going to talk about it for a minute, and then we're going to go on to another chapter which displays Dooku's actual thoughts about what Anakin just did. And then after that, we'll jump to another chapter that will focus on Anakin's thoughts as he's buried within the rubble while Dooku escapes. And these thoughts are the ones that are quite troubling because he starts to have actual visions of Padme dying. So here we go from the top. For every droid either of them destroyed, five more would appear, creating an impenetrable barrier between them and the doorway, through which Dooku had certainly disappeared moments before they had arrived. Dooku! Anakin snarled through clenched teeth. I will kill you! Control your rage, Anakin, Obi-Wan managed to say between breaths. Don't give him the satisfaction. Anakin shot him a worrisome scowl. Can't have me becoming too powerful now, can we, master? Before Obi-Wan could reply, 20 battle droids hurried into the room through the door behind him. Whirling, he deflected their first barrage, then fought his way to cover behind a heap of dismembered droids where Anakin joined him. In the hope that Dooku was listening from afar, he shouted, Whatever happened here, Dooku, your confederacy is finished. The Republic has all of you on the run, even your master. Sidious. More droids appeared. To Dooku, this was nothing more than a game, Obi-Wan told himself. But if it was a demonstration of force ability that Dooku wanted, then Anakin was still more than willing to provide it. Dooku! He howled, with such force and wrath that the ceiling of the vast hall began to collapse. Dragging himself out from under plasteel girders and chunks of ferrocrete, Count Dooku came shakily to his feet and gazed in astonished disbelief at the shambles of the control room. Had the containment dome been so weak that it had succumbed to flurries of ricocheting blaster bolts? Or had Skywalker's voiced rage actually called the ceiling down? Had Dooku not left forcefully at the last moment, he might have been buried, as the two Jedi were, somewhere below, in the expanse of rubble that covered the archive room. He was certain that they had survived, but if nothing else, they were trapped, which had been the intent from the start. But Skywalker, assuming that he had grown powerful enough to have collapsed the dome, the end result was simply further evidence that he would someday undo himself, wasn't it? Because admitting to any alternative explanation meant accepting that Skywalker was potentially a greater threat to the Sith than anyone realized. Initially, it had cheered him to observe that Skywalker and Kenobi had finally learned to fight together, to see how powerful they had become in partnership, complementing each other's strengths compensating for each other's weaknesses. Kenobi making full use of his inherent discretion to balance young Skywalker's inattentive rowdiness. 
could have watched them until the light faded on Fair Tithe, and he wished that General Grievous could be here to witness the display for himself. Now he wasn't so sure. It was an impressive display of power to be sure, but unfortunately, it only managed to provide the perfect distraction for Dooku to escape. However, though buried beneath the rubble and debris, both of the Jedi duo are unharmed. But visions of Padme, death, and destruction have steadily been haunting the young Skywalker, and now trapped under the remains of the dome, the vision becomes more vivid than ever. Here's an excerpt from the book, and then we can talk about it. In the darkness, buried alive, Anakin stretched out with his feelings. In his mind's eye, he saw Padme stalked by a dark, towering creature with a mechanical head. Poised at the edge of a deep abyss, her world turned upside down. A surprise attack, opponents locked in combat, ground and sky filled with fire, smoke billowing in the air, clouding everything. Death, destruction, deceit, a labyrinth of lies. His world turned upside down. He shuddered, as if plunged into liquid gas. One touch would break him to a million shards. His fear for Padme expanded until he couldn't see past it. Yoda's voice in his ear, Fear leads to anger, anger to hatred, hatred to the dark side. He was as afraid to lose her as he was to hold on to her, and the pain of that contradiction made him wish he had never been born. There was no solace, even in the Force. As Qui-Gon had told him, he needed to make sure his focus was his reality. But how? How? Qui-Gon, who had died, even though to his young mind, Jedi weren't supposed to, beside him, Obi-Wan stirred and coughed. You're getting awfully good at destroying things, he said. On Vun, you needed a grenade to do this much damage. Anakin shook the vision from his mind. I told you I was becoming more powerful. Then do us both a favor by getting us out from under all this. They used the force, their hands and backs to extricate themselves. Getting to their feet, they stood staring at each other, dusted white, head to toe from the debris. He was afraid to lose her as he was to hold on to her. What did Anakin mean by this? Now, I'm gonna get back to this question in a moment. First, the vision he is struck by could be foretelling Anakin about the upcoming attack by General Grievous on Coruscant, possibly. After all, the cyborg general is a being with a mechanical head, and will conduct a surprise attack on the capital world, which will endanger Padme. When he goes to kidnap the Chancellor, there will be opponents locked in combat as the vision stipulates. The bombardments from the Separatist fleet will make the ground and sky fill with fire and smoke. But of course, the vision could also perfectly describe another destined future that is a threat to Padme. One we are far more familiar with. One with perhaps a different mechanical being, a different surprise attack, from a friend this time, with two brothers locked in combat on a world filled from ground to sky with smoke and fire. But going back to my first question, Anakin is both afraid to lose and to hold on to Padme. We can tell from this passage that I just read how much his love for his wife clashes with his responsibilities to the Jedi and the Force. His double life is tearing him apart. Just like they said in episode two, they can't live like this. So he doesn't want to lose Padme for obvious reasons as he wants to spend the rest of his life with the woman he loves. Yet the Jedi in him knows that he can never truly commit to the Order and to the light side if he stays with her. Either way, stay or leave Padme, the choice requires Anakin to sacrifice an important part of himself. It's no wonder that he can feel like it was better if he hadn't been born. So before I wrap it up, I was curious what you guys thought about Qui-Gon Jinn's instruction to Anakin to make his focus his reality. This is something he talks about in episode one. Did Anakin decide Padme was his focus, his reality? And with that focus, he was able to slaughter his former friends and allies in the Jedi Temple. If so, was it Qui-Gon Jinn's teachings and not Darth Sidious's that aided the young Darth Vader during Order 66? From a certain point of view, of course. Now, one thing I found really interesting about this is that Dooku was so astonished with how powerful Anakin had become. I mean, this is just another testament as to how powerful the Chosen One was, in the sense that he didn't even know how strong he had become. And these were the new powers that he was starting to develop and feel just as he turned to the dark side. This is why he tells Obi-Wan, or at least in my opinion is why he tells Obi-Wan, you underestimate my powers, because these powers that he was feeling and developing were all new. He just didn't have enough time to actually learn how to use them. This force rage that he showed and collapsed the whole dome of the building was something unintentional. He obviously didn't mean to do that. He just didn't have any control of his force powers. He's kind of like Phoenix from the X-Men. So full of power, but untamed and uncontrolled. Now, I truly believe if he had lived a little bit longer on Mustafar, then he would have definitely learned to own these powers, at least somewhat more or if he had stayed in the light, he would have really become a master of his abilities. But of course, we got what we got with the story. Now, it is said that Starkiller from The Force Unleashed was actually supposed to be a showcase of how powerful Luke was supposed to become 
at his full potential. Now, if Anakin was supposed to be just as or maybe a little more powerful than Luke, it just goes to show what he could have done had he stayed in the light, or at least not lost on Mustafar. All of Anakin's issues and problems came from within. They all came from his own mind, which he created into this monster demon type thing that took over his whole life and existence and changed the fate of the galaxy. Now a fan theory and a popular one is that Palpatine actually put all of these visions in his head. In a video I did a long time ago, it was actually said that Dooku corralled the Sand People to get Shmi, to get Anakin's mother. And I believe all of these things were tiny little strings that were being pulled by Palpatine from the background. If you remember, he was the one who wanted Obi-Wan and Anakin to be on the case for Padme and her assassin. He could have chose any other Jedi, but he made a good argument as to why Obi-Wan would have been the one, even though they hadn't seen her in about 10 years. Palpatine knew what he was doing, and everything was deliberately done in the background. This is why I believe all of those visions and dreams and things were possibly planted in his own mind. That being said, one of Anakin's greatest powers was his ability to see into the future, his visions, his premonitions. So therefore, it also leads me to believe that maybe Palpatine wasn't the one that put these visions in his head. Maybe this was just the will of the Force and he had to end up as Darth Vader. There wasn't any other outcome that the Force wanted. Definitely some interesting theories here to think about and talk about, and maybe we can go over them in another video. There is an excerpt here as well, which I didn't read, which talks about Dooku theorizing on what he would do if Grievous had died. See, at this point, Grievous was on course on fighting Mace Windu, and that's another video I'm gonna make on its own as well. But essentially, he thinks about, well, if Grievous died, then what is he gonna do? And funny enough, there's actually a part in there where it talks about Yoda accepting him back into the Jedi Temple. But there are a few caveats there that we need to go over in another video, which would make it really interesting. The first time Anakin used the dark side in the movies was during episode two, where he left Naboo to find his mother on Tatooine, purely based on a bad feeling. Now, I will mention that in the EU and comics, before Disney took over and after, there have been other cases where Anakin has showed dark side emotions. However, this is the most canon and the most evident to the entire Star Wars universe in general. After tracking his mother down in the desert, he came across a tribe of Tusken Raiders who had captured and tortured her. Upon rescuing her, she died in his arms very quickly. Anakin began to feel a rage build within him, something he had never felt so vividly. He was obsessed with being the master of control over all things around him, and this, the death of his mother, was something he had no power over. If we observe closely, it was the death of Padme that turned him to the dark side, and the possible death of his son Luke that turned him back to the light, killing Emperor Palpatine, causing him to go mad for all of these reasons. I'm going to read out two sources for you guys. The first being the Disney canon book Star Wars 100 Scenes, which outlines the top biggest 100 moments in the movies and gives a brief yet extremely detailed perception on them, and the second being the actual novelization of Episode 2 Attack the Clone. The first quotes, Anakin searches the desert wastes for his mother. His quest ends in grief and pain, leading to rage fueled by the dark side of the Force. The episode is a glimpse of the future. Anakin's inability to master his emotions will lead to tragedy for himself and those he loves. The second, which is the original as it was the novelization of the film, is the original reiteration. However, it goes into much more detail. I think you'll enjoy this. At that time, the only meaning, the only purpose, that Anakin could fathom was that of the rage building within him. An anger at losing someone he did not wish to give up. Some small part of him warned him not to give in to that anger, warned him that such emotions were of the dark side. So that passage was right before Anakin killed the Sand People, and now it's just after he kills the first few. Which in the movies is where we see it cut to Yoda meditating. And then he was running, his strides enhanced by the Force, overcoming the fleeing creatures, slaughtering them, every one. He didn't feel empty any longer. He felt a surge of energy and strength beyond anything he had ever known. Felt full of the Force, full of power, full of life. So, as we can see, this was Anakin's first step into a world that led him down a path no one else could follow. A path to the dark side. This is why Yoda always was so adamant about not giving in to the hatred of the dark side. Not even once, because that's all it takes. It's just one taste, one feeling, one act to get him addicted. But beware of the dark side. Anger, fear, aggression. The dark side of the Force are they. Easily they flow. Quick to join you in a fight. 
If once you start down the dark path, forever will it dominate your destiny, consume you at will, as it did Obi-Wan's apprentice. Vader. Now, it can be argued that if the vengeful massacre of an entire tribe of sand people doesn't qualify as anger and aggression, then what does? In accordance, sand people are reasonably tough fighters, like what they did to Luke in episode 4, and Anakin was greatly outnumbered. He was using the force to beat them, and if that too requires the dark side to enhance his actions, then by all means the Jedi must do what needs to be done. This was one reason why Mace Windu was so powerful. It's because he harnessed both sides of the force. He was a true force user. Some might call him a Dark Jedi, while others might call him a Light Sith, but in the end, he chose to reign peace and justice, and used every single advantage he knew of to do so for a greater cause. Now, if using the dark side in this situation is the only way to get out of a tribe infested with killer Tusken Raiders who killed your mother, then by all means I think there should be an exception. I never understood the Council's dogmatic views regarding situations like these. How could one not be angry? This is just another testament as to why the Council was flawed in so many ways, and how Qui-Gon Jinn really saw it. He felt the Council was too focused on politics, and not enough with allowing the Force to guide one's actions. I mentioned this in another video as well. In Legends, Jin turned to the dark side, albeit very briefly, he eventually snapped out of it when the voice of Tal, his love interest who had died, spoke to him in a vision. Now, I wonder what would have happened if he actually did go through with the dark side like Anakin. Would it have been his first of many turns? In Revenge of the Sith, we got the biggest turning point in the Star Wars universe, Order 66, where Anakin cut off Mace Windu's hand and Sidious threw him out the window. It was after this that Anakin was dubbed as Darth Vader. The entire conversation from the novel is quite different from what we got in the film. Palpatine was actually a lot more manipulative in the book where Anakin would say things like he was unsure and that it was hard for him to turn so quickly because he was a Jedi for so long. This was where Palpatine would say that it basically comes down to him choosing between the Jedi and Padme's life. This is where Anakin basically accepted his new role as a Sith Lord and Sidious told him to wipe out the Jedi at the temple and then go to Mustafar, to the secret base where the Separatist leadership remained. As Anakin marched to the temple with the 501st clones behind him, which later on became Vader's fist, they left no creature alive, as Sidious literally ordered for him to do in the novel. Now something I'm going to also mention before we continue with the video is that in one of the original scripts, one of the drafts for the scripts for Revenge of the Sith, George Lucas had written that Sidious reveals that he was actually Anakin's father. Now it's not super clear in the script if Palpatine was actually telling the complete truth or if it was Plagueis that created him, but it would seem, you know, with Palpatine's manipulations, that he was definitely saying that, hey, I created you. Even going as far as saying, you could basically call me your father. Now I've made a video of that in the past, but for today's video, we want to talk about the first person that Anakin killed during the Jedi Temple, and it gets a little graphic, so be warned. Gate Master Jurok sprinted through the empty vaulted hallway, clattering echoes of his footsteps making him sound like a platoon. The main doors of the temple were slowly swinging inward in answer to the code key punched into the outside lock pad. The Gate Master had seen him on the monitor, Anakin Skywalker, alone. The huge doors creaked inwards. As soon as they were wide enough for the Gate Master to pass, he slipped through. Anakin stood in the night outside, shoulders hunched, head down against the rain. Anakin, he gasped, running up to the young man. Anakin, what happened? Where are the masters? Anakin looked at him as though he wasn't sure who the gate master was. Where is Shock T? In the meditation chambers. We felt something happen in the force, something awful. She's searching the force in deep meditation, trying to get some feel for what's going on. His words trailed away. Anakin didn't seem to be listening. Something has happened, hasn't it? Jurok looked past him now. The night beyond the temple was full of clones, battalions of them, brigades, thousands. Anakin, he said slowly, what's going on? Something's happened, something horrible, how bad is it? The last thing Jurok felt was the emitter of a lightsaber against the soft flesh beneath his jaw. The last thing he heard, as blue plasma chewed up upward through his head and burst out from the top of his skull and burned away his life, was Anakin Skywalker's melancholy reply. You have no idea. So obviously, as we can see, the Gate Master was killed within an instant, and it's pretty dark. The rest of the novel is extremely dark like this as well, and George Lucas was even going to go as far as putting dead younglings on the floor of the Jedi Temple. 
but he thought that would be a little bit too dark, and so he cut that out. Now, you're probably wondering who this Jurok guy is. Well, he's a bit of a funny story. See, he was in the Revenge of the Sith novel, then he was in the complete Star Wars Encyclopedia in 2008, but later then he was retconned in 2012 to ever have appeared in Revenge of the Sith. But he was in the book and remains in print to this day, so... I find it a bit confusing as to why he was plucked out in 2012 randomly. Jurok was trusted to watch over the defense of the Jedi Temple as the Gate Master. When Mace Windu left with the other Jedi Masters to arrest Palpatine, he ended up telling Shakti and Jurok to watch over the defenses of the Temple. However, even though he was attuned to the Force, Jurok couldn't sense that Skywalker had turned to the dark side and was slain without a chance to defend himself. Now, of the hundreds, if not maybe even thousands of Jedi that Anakin or Darth Vader has gone to kill in his life, Jurok was amongst the first that he actually killed. And for those who think he killed Mace Windu, well, he didn't. He took his hand off, and then, well, we know the rest of the story. Palpatine finished the job. But this was actually the first Jedi that he killed, which opened their way to the temple, and then they executed Order 66 on everyone including the younglings. It was after this that Anakin went to Mustafar and then battled Obi-Wan, later turning into the masked man we all know and love and fear, Darth Vader. Hey guys, how are you doing today? So Jedi and Sith have the ability to sense one another's presence through the Force, the way a dog might smell meat or a shark smell blood. The ability was something that made it easy for Vader to sense Obi-Wan on board the Death Star. So that raises the question, why didn't Anakin sense him on Padme's ship, on Mustafar? Especially with no other life forces around other than the creatures of Mustafar, Anakin should have easily sensed his master's familiar presence. I mean, this is Anakin Skywalker we're talking about, the Chosen One. He was unbelievably powerful and could sense when Padme was in danger in Episode 2, not to mention all the dreams that he had of his mother, which caused him to go to Tatooine and save her, albeit a little bit too late, of course. So him not being able to sense Obi-Wan is just a little bit weird and out of character, and it's definitely not plot armor here, as there's a reason for it. The reason is revealed in the Legends novel The Dark Lord, The Rise of Darth Vader. It covers a narrative where Vader thinks back on all that he's done, basically going over all the events of Revenge of the Sith, however this time as the masked Vader. Here's the piece from the novel. Anakin Skywalker was gone. Or was he? After all, Padme had fallen in love with Anakin, not Darth Vader. He had not anticipated that Padme, traveling with C-3PO, would follow him to Mustafar and refute the righteousness of his actions. Nor had he foreseen that Obi-Wan would survive the Jedi Purge, and that the deceitful Padme would bring him with her. Despite his powers and years of attunement to Obi-Wan, his rage had blocked his ability to sense his former master's presence on Mustafar. Until he saw the Jedi standing in the hatch of Padme's starship. He also never imagined that Obi-Wan possessed the strength to bring him down so brutally. This is clearly self-explanatory here, but I want to make a few mentions about it. I really like the continuity that George Lucas has in the books and the films, at least for this bit here. Anakin's rage blinded him from his surroundings, and this is a common flaw with the dark side. It makes you so tunnel vision that it blocks out all of your senses and visions of what's around you as you become engulfed and entranced by your own very rage. This is the same thing that happened to the Emperor when he was killing Luke, and that's why he was blindsided by Vader even while being thrown off the balcony of the shaft. He was far too fixated on his rage of killing Vader once in the air, and by then, it was too late for him to come to his senses. Hey everyone, today's video comes from the brand new Vader comic, which has one big piece that I want to highlight and talk about. In the comic, Vader goes through the portal finally after crushing Moment in order to meet Padme. He travels through what many think is the world between worlds and... Well, I'll explain more of that in a full video covering the full comic, but as he's going through this world, or what I like to call the Echoes of Time itself, he comes across one of the first things that he sees, his mother. But she's younger, and she's pregnant with him. The words echo through the planet, there was no father, which is what she told Qui-Gon Jinn when they met and discussed Anakin. Quickly, from behind her, Palpatine appears as a Force ghost almost, alluding to the fact that he was manipulating the Force around her, either from afar or using some sort of Sith magic to conceal himself from her. Maybe he was doing this in her sleep, who knows. What we do see is inside her belly, and that is the conception of the Chosen One, a swirl almost like a galaxy of energy being generated, being created, conceived. And through the pages, the words echo around him, unnatural, the Chosen One. Now. Could this be someone saying the Chosen One's birth was unnatural? Or, since we know it's a place that echoes words that have already been said, where else have we heard the word unnatural before? That's right, when Palpatine was explaining the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise. Alluding back to that moment in the opera and then, 
to his conception in his mother's womb. Now, at the end of the comic has Sidious telling Vader that just about everything in this world is a lie, but what we just saw wasn't really from this world. So it makes me a little confused if what he just saw was really what happened or just a fabrication. If you ask me, I'm going with it. I think this is the real case. Now that we've seen it told in canon, it aligns perfectly with Legends as well, as I've covered the Legends aspect in videos too, where Sidious says in the unedited script of the Revenge of the Sith that he was the one who manipulated the midichlorians to create life. This can all be found in the book The Making of Revenge of the Sith. I think this is it guys, I don't know, Sidious I think really made Anakin. Now in the Legends novel Darth Plagueis, Plagueis tried to make this ultimate Sith out of the dark side. However, the Force retaliated and created Anakin to bring balance to the light and the dark. Now I should say Darth Plagueis wasn't written by George Lucas, it was just approved by the Lucasfilm group. So I'm gonna go with the unedited version of the Revenge of the Sith, which is what George wrote, saying that Palpatine was the father. And now we get it in canon that Palpatine well, looks like conceived Anakin. So let me know, do you think Anakin really just saw his true father, that being Sidious? And maybe the big question can finally be put to rest? Or are we just being teased? I think it's legit, but maybe we'll learn more in upcoming books or the prequels or something. The Jedi of old were known for being able to endure the hardest of situations with the Force as their ally. By the time of the movies, the Jedi had lost many of these insane abilities since they had no need to use them. The Sith were gone, and their only enemies were weak-minded fools with uncivilized weapons. One of these somewhat lost abilities was called Control Pain, the power to use the Force to completely ignore pain. And while most Jedi could ignore discomfort, ignoring excruciating torture or debilitating pain wasn't something everyone could do. In Legends, Luke uses it to ignore ignore the pain of a blaster bolt, and in canon, we're finally seeing it again. In the new canon audiobook, Jedi Lost, we learn that Jedi Master Dooku was a master of this technique, and even showed it to his Padawan, Qui-Gon Jinn. It wasn't a technique Dooku learned from Master Yoda either, but from Lin Kostana, a Jedi Master obsessed with preparing the Jedi for the return of the Sith. In this scene from the book, Dooku tells Qui-Gon to strap him into a device which will send massive electronic pulses through Dooku's chest and body, a power so intense that it produces such pain that some races use it as a torture device. Now, here I'm gonna read from the book itself. I do not wish to hurt you, Master, Qui-Gon tells him. And you won't, Dooku pushes back. Back. Through the Force, a Jedi can endure even the most debilitating pain. Remember the Battle of Nashadar? Master Khrustan fought on even after being immolated by the Flame Wielders. Now just take a side note real quick, but remember this because in a bit we'll talk about Anakin and how control pain connects to him and the immense pain he felt not only being immolated himself but also after having three limbs chopped off. Qui-Gon continues in the book by saying, Injuries that would have crippled any warrior, but we live in an age of peace, and long may it continue, interrupts Dooku. However, this technique can ease discomfort on any level. The principles I teach you today can be used to soothe any pain, be it physical or mental. Now, activate the band. Qui-Gon activates the energy pulses band around his master. The pain shoots through him like force lightning. Good, turn the dial, grunts Dooku. Are you sure? Asks Qui-Gon hesitantly. I wouldn't have asked you if I were not, shouts back Dooku impatiently. Qui-Gon raises the power of the pulse. The pain intensifies, but Dooku smiles. Good, grunts Dooku. Now reach out with the force. What do you feel? Qui-Gon concentrates. Your discomfort. Dooku shrugs it off. Hardly surprising, but if I could focus my thoughts and calm my emotions. Pain is only an illusion. It can be controlled. He gasps under the immense pain but fights on. I am a Jedi. Qui-Gon senses a change. Your pain, I cannot sense it anymore. Nor can I, responds Dooku confidently. The pain is still there. I am merely denying its power over me. Qui-Gon can't believe it. I would like to try, but Dooku just laughs. You are eager. I like that. And learn you shall, my young Padawan. The scene ends there and Dooku suggests that Qui-Gon could potentially teach it to his own apprentice one day. So the question is, did he? And if he did, did Obi-Wan teach it to Anakin? The Jedi had been at peace for generations, so things like control pain and other battle-hardened abilities were ignored by many, especially since so few of them felt that the Sith would one day return. The Jedi believed that if the Sith tried to return, the Force would warn them with plenty of time to prepare. Even Master Yoda didn't think they would return anytime soon. In short, the Jedi became complacent, so even if Qui-Gon learned control pain from Dooku, it's unlikely that Qui-Gon practiced it very often. Enough to master it at all, or that Obi-Wan was able to master it too. So by the time Anakin received training, it's unlikely that he learned to do it beyond an introduction, if at all. This may be one of the many abilities that Anakin feared the Jedi were not teaching him. So 
if Anakin didn't know control pain, we know why he wasn't able to be like Master Krustan and keep fighting after being burned alive during his duel with Obi-Wan. If this is the case, then we're done talking and we can end the video here, but this is Star Wars theory. So let's theorize that Anakin did indeed learn the power of control pain and talk about it briefly and then I can make an actual fanfiction about it later on if you guys want. So let's say he knew this power. If he had learned it, then he would have learned it while he was a Jedi through the light side of the Force, and he may have been very good at it, but on Mustafar, he was immersed with the dark side, so he didn't know how to use the ability anymore. Anakin was beyond conflicted emotionally during his duel with Obi-Wan. Nowhere near able to focus his thoughts or calm his emotions like Dooku said was required to quell the pain. Anakin was all over the place. He could not calm himself and fuel his rage at the same time. I believe this was one of the most confusing moments of Anakin's life, and when he felt the most helpless. Now, Palpatine does say that his anger and rage gives him focus, but Anakin was still very new to the dark side, so for him to use this technique would have been something that was very out of the norm. It was his moment of having all the power in the world, but not knowing how to use it. He couldn't use any of his light side powers because they conflicted with the dark side, but he couldn't use the dark side fully yet because Palpatine simply hadn't taught him how. As Yoda could counsel Luke years later, Anakin had unlearned everything that he had learned, and just not on purpose. If Anakin had known how to use the dark side fully, he could have tapped into his pain to give him greater power, something like what Maul would have done. This is what Kylo Ren does after getting shot by Chewie, or when Darth Sidious does it after Vader breaks his legs, yet he's still able to stand, you know, in shards of the past. So whatever the reason is, Anakin didn't use this power, but I can't help but imagine what would have happened if Anakin had used it and overcome the pain of losing his limbs and being burned. Like, what if Anakin completely overcame his pain and then levitated himself with the force in front of Obi-Wan. At that point, you gotta think, you know, Obi-Wan would just probably jump in the lava himself since there's really no beating Anakin. He's kind of turned into Frieza when he got chopped in half against Goku. Now, I have a few fan fictions and theories on what would have happened if Anakin beat Obi-Wan on Mustafar, so check those out if you like. I need to make some part twos to those as well. So I wanna know what you guys think. Do you wanna see more of the force power control pain? Do you think Anakin knew how to do it but couldn't figure it out when he needed it? Or do you think he was just all over the place and maybe the pain of what he was going through was just far beyond what control pain could have given him. Anakin Skywalker was the most powerful person in the galaxy. The chosen one, the one to bring balance to the Force. He was saved by Qui-Gon when he was just a little boy as a slave and brought to the Jedi Temple for immediate training to fulfill their ancient prophecy of bringing balance to the Force. Throughout his life, he was constantly proving that he was more powerful than everyone, yet he was still held back by the Jedi. It was for this reason Anakin's frustration continued to swell and fester. Over the years, it bothered him so much that it came down to him blaming the Jedi for recognizing his powers yet failing to teach him to his full potential. Once he had dreams of Padme dying in childbirth, he wanted to save her, but didn't know how. He felt he should be able to. He was powerful enough. He just didn't have the knowledge and he blamed the Jedi for this. Once his inevitable turn to the dark side had begun at the hands of Emperor Palpatine, he was dubbed Vader and the Anakin Skywalker that we knew was no more. However, when was the first time that Vader acknowledged this himself and the audience knew about it. It's not in the films, but it is in the book. It's a cool little scene that takes place on Mustafar where he's sent to wipe out the Separatists, and there's a line in there that was actually cut out from the film. As Vader lands down on Mustafar, Palpatine speaks to Newt Gunray, when the question of Lord Vader's arrival has been confirmed. As Sidious promises them a large reward in Vader's hands for them, the transmission ends and Vader walks into the doorway. Sandhill beat the others to the greeting. Welcome, Lord Vader. Now, obviously, this is not Sand Hill. This is Newt Gunray. Things do change in the script, in the book, and the film, so keep that in mind. His elongated legs almost tangled with each other in his rush to shake the hand of the Sith Lord. On behalf of the leadership of the Confederacy of Independent Systems, let me be the first to... Very well, you will be the first. The cloaked figure stepped inside and made a gesture with a black-gloved hand. Blast doors slammed across every exit. The control panel exploded in a shower of sparking wires. The cloaked figure threw back its hood. Sand Hill recoiled, hands flapping like panicked birds sewn to his wrists. You're, you're Anakin Skywalker. Before a fountain of blue-white plasma burned into his chest, curving through a loop that charred all three of his hearts, the Separatist leadership watched in frozen horror as the corpse of the head of the intergalactic banking clan collapsed like a deep-powered protocol droid. The resemblance, Darth Vader said, 
is deceptive. This is the very first time in Star Wars history where we as the audience see the complete disassociation between Vader and Anakin and that he knows it. The resemblance is deceptive, meaning yeah, he looks like Anakin, but he isn't the same person at all anymore. Now obviously we can never say that Anakin was killed entirely, to do so would be clickbait and flat out wrong. Vader suppressed Anakin to almost nothing, but not completely gone. He was still in there, somewhere, and we've seen this in the comics and all that, but mainly because of how the end of Return of the Jedi played out. Anakin was the return of the Jedi. And that's a common misconception is that a lot of people think Luke was the return of the Jedi, but really it was Anakin who was, you know, returned from Vader. Now in that very scene where Vader goes to Mustafar and wipes out the Separatist leaders, there's a part in the book which explains all the things that he actually did, such as exploding a door with his hand, and like these are all things that I want to explain in another video. So if you guys want that, just let me know down below. You all remember in Revenge of the Sith when Anakin said, from my point of view, the Jedi are evil. While I've done a video about this in the past, that one just covers some info from the Revenge of the Sith book. Today's information will be more legit as it comes from George Lucas himself. During episode 3, or you know, all of the prequels in general, we see a huge arc with Anakin's personality and growth as a character. As a little boy, he starts out afraid, yet curious and adventurous for his new life as a Jedi. Then he becomes transfixed with Padme and it changes his behavior in general. We all know the rest. He had to choose between saving his wife from his vivid premonitions and being loyal to the Jedi, who always held him back. That moment on Mustafar against Obi-Wan, when Master Kenobi tells him that Chancellor Palpatine is evil. He replies with, from my point of view, the Jedi are evil. While we all understand that he had turned to the dark side and was supposed to be the bad guy in the story, what George Lucas says about his point of view is this. Anakin's rationalization is, everybody is after power. Even the Jedi are after power. Therefore, he thinks they're all equally corrupt now. So which side am I going to be on? Do I align myself with Palpatine, who is a Sith Lord and who can possibly help me save Padme? Or do I side with the Jedi and maybe lose Padme? Looking at it from that point of view, if you were to look at things like Anakin did, then we can kind of see where he was going. While what he did of course was wrong, I can now see his point of view. This actually makes a lot of sense to me. It was the lesser of two evils in the grand scheme of things. Now going as far as killing younglings and betraying your friends is obviously very wrong. If Anakin had thought things through just a little bit, he would have mentioned to the council or something that, you know, look, I've had these dreams about Padme and I want them to go away or I want to find a way to save her in which they would comfort him or they would look into it deeper or maybe grant him access to the restriction section, which is why he wanted to become a master in the first place. But it was his panic and lack of patience that ultimately went hand in hand with his doom. If he only spoke to Master Yoda about it further, or Mace Windu or Obi-Wan, I think things could have gone a lot differently. From his point of view, everyone was evil, so if he's going to become evil too, then does he become evil with Padme alive or evil with Padme dead? With those two ultimatums, it's a simple choice. However, we all know it didn't have to be so black and white. There were other options. I still fully believe that had Anakin spoke to Qui-Gon, somehow, even through the Force or a dream or something, things could have been changed. Now if Qui-Gon was alive, I think the galaxy would have been completely different in general, but that's a different video for a different time. I guess we'll never really know the true answer to that, however, I'd like to do a fanfiction on it once I'm back from LA. Hey guys, in today's video we'll be covering something partly from the Jedi Code and why this act was actually so extremely forbidden. Had the Council found out about what really happened, Anakin would have had to stand trial for sure. Count Dooku was one of the best lightsaber duelists on the Council, and when he left due to their heavy role in politics and lost Jedi ways, he eventually turned to the ways of the Dark Side by the hand of Darth Sidious, also known as Palpatine. He ran as the head of the Separatist army, or at least the face of it while Sidious pulled the strings, and he was involved in the handling of the many attacks on Padme Amidala's life with Newt Gunray. When Anakin fought him in Episode 2, he lost not only the battle, but his right arm as well. In Episode 3, they fight again on screen, where Anakin's powers have now doubled. As the fight commences and Anakin ends up taking his hands, which we learned in yesterday's video was called Chomai, a sign of mastery over the opponent. Dooku drops to his knees in submission and acceptance of his loss. It's at this point we see much conflict within Anakin Skywalker, as he's about to slice off Dooku's head. He actually never intended on killing the former Jedi Master. However, with Palpatine's constant nudges to kill him, he eventually succumbed into his temptations and beheaded him. We see there's tons going through his head during this moment. That's obvious. He even himself says that he shouldn't do it, 
but eventually does. Dooku is bad, we know this, so why not kill him? He was involved with everything I mentioned and more, so it was justified. However, this was actually something that was written in the Jedi Codebook that disallowed Jedi from performing this deadly beheading maneuver. Now, if a Sith were making this decision, there would be no hesitation, as the Sith rely on violence and anger to fuel their power. But Anakin was still mostly in the light side of the Force at this point, and his act was forbidden by the Jedi Order for this very explanation. Saicha comes from the ancient words for separate and head, and as you might expect, it describes the act of using a lightsaber to behead an opponent. Jedi commit Saicha only when battle is at its most deadly serious and threatening, or when an opponent is considered extremely dangerous, even to a fully trained Jedi. Now it goes on to explain a story between Qui-Gon, Obi-Wan, and a villain who Qui-Gon eventually had to behead, and why he did this, and how he had to actually explain it to the council. However, in today's video, we're just going to cut right to why Dooku was beheaded and how it was forbidden. So Dooku at this point was not a threat, so that rules that out. Secondly, he wasn't extremely dangerous to Anakin considering Anakin beat him through Chomai, removing both of his hands, and because he was also on his knees in submission of the duel, at Anakin's mercy. Mace Windu performed Sai Cha against Jango because it was extremely dangerous to keep him alive, and there was no time to spare while he was shooting at him constantly. Palpatine wanted Anakin to do this forbidden move because he wanted him to feel the raw power of giving into his anger and emotion, following through with his flow of power at that moment. As Dooku told him, you have hate, you have anger, but you don't use them. Which is when Anakin switches on his rage and defeats him. This coupled with the fact that he didn't want Dooku questioned by the council and blabbing about who Palpatine really is. So this is why that move was such a conflict for Anakin. Not only was it just a devastating move, but it was against the Jedi Code to do. I wonder what the council would have gotten out of Dooku had he been brought back as a prisoner of war and questioned. How's it going guys? I hope you're all having an awesome day today. So probably one of my favorite scenes in Revenge of the Sith was this one here, where Palpatine talks to Anakin about Darth Plagueis, telling him that there's an old Sith Lord who knew how to cheat death and save the ones he loved. Something the movie never did was show us just what Anakin did right after learning of this Darth Plagueis that Palpatine spoke of. So after the opera scene, Anakin left to his speeder, which was outlined in the novel itself, as he just sat in it to think deep in thought. He then called Padme and told her something's come up, that he'll be spending the night at the temple and won't come home. As they do their lovey-dovey stuff and she sends him a goodnight kiss, he ends the transmission and the rest I'll narrate for you. Anakin fired thrusters and slid the speeder expertly into traffic, angling towards the Jedi Temple. Because that part, the part about spending the night at the temple, was the part that wasn't a lie. The lie was that he was going to rest, that he was going to even try. How could he rest when every time he closed his eyes he could see her screaming on the birthing table? Now, the Council's insult burned hotter than ever. He even had a name, a story, a place to start, but how could he explain to the Archives Master why he needed to research a Sith legend of immortality? Maybe he didn't need the Archives after all. The Temple was still the greatest nexus of Force energy on the planet, perhaps even the galaxy, and it was unquestionably the best place in the galaxy for intense, focused meditation. He had much he needed the Force to teach him, and a very short time to learn. He would start by thinking inwards, thinking about himself. Good. <laughs> so what I wish we saw in the movie was this scene right here. Anakin leaving the opera all disgruntled and confused, deep in thought as he races through the course and night sky to the Jedi Temple. To go to the archives and ask Dracosta New to find Darth Plagueis' teachings, or at least some form of immortality hinted in one of the books about the Sith legend. However, we would then see as he thinks further, he realizes that maybe he doesn't need the archives, that he doesn't even need help from his masters. Rather, he could use the temple's force nexus. Now, that part might be a little bit confusing to some. You see, in the old legends, a dark side nexus resided underneath the Jedi Temple itself, in conjunction with the light side nexus that the Jedi Temple spires emanated as well. This is where Anakin got the idea of becoming all-powerful himself. I mean, he always wanted to be, but now he had reason, and he thought he could do it himself. Not relying on the Sith legend, but rather, for the first time, focusing inwards to unlock this knowledge on his own just as a true Sith would. And so now we can see the small, trickling bit of Sith mentality that kept prodding at Anakin's mind, which kind of helps us understand just how he could cut Master Windu's hand off so easily. As we now see, he's been in this state of mind for quite some time. So I thought this bit was pretty interesting to make a video on. Which video of mine that I've made explaining the novels do you wish we got to see in the films? 
For me, there's a few, but one that sticks out for the most is probably the one where Mace and Palpatine fight from Anakin's perspective, which just shows them as purple and red blurred speeds of light as they move around faster than his eyes can track. That would have been pretty sweet to see. So here's one of those videos that has been covered countless times over the internet. However, due to constant demand in comments, Facebook polls, and tweets, I'll explain this video in my style of presentation. So Anakin showed up in Episode 3 with a scar just to the corner of his right eye, something reminiscent to Scar in The Lion King. It was originally added by Lucas, however, with no backstory, he simply just put it there because he thought it looked cool. In an interview about the scar, he had this to say about it when asked. I don't know, ask Howard, said George, referring to the president of Lucas Licensing, Howard Rothman. That's one of those things that happens in the novels between the movies. I just put it in there. He has to explain how it got there. I think Anakin got it slipping in the bathtub, but of course, he's not going to tell anybody about that. So, leaving it to Howard, there was a comic book that was published back in 2004 titled Republic No. 71, The Dreadnoughts of Rendili, which takes place roughly one year before Revenge of the Sith, and in the comic, Anakin duels a dark side user by the name of Asajj Ventress. Now, for those who haven't seen The Clone Wars, she was basically Dooku's side apprentice, as short as I could put it, and later she had an entire standalone comic with Quinlan Boss. However, that's neither here nor there. So, in the comic, Anakin went to the course and under levels to privately listen to a hologram from Padme. It was here where he was followed by Ventress. She took the holodisc with the Force and destroyed it, engaging him in battle. Besting Anakin, she left him to find Padme, which made him very angry. The two continued to fight when Ventress slashed him across the eye, not once, but twice, leaving his iconic, mysterious scar. I suppose George Lucas added it in because it was his way to symbolize Anakin's growth, from the boy we saw in Attack of the Clones to a hardened and much more mature Anakin in Revenge of the Sith. One thing I do find odd about this is how Luke was attacked by the Wampa in Episode 5, and all of his wounds healed without any scars after the back to tank. I think Anakin probably thought it looked mysterious and dangerous or cool, and so he kept it. So today's video is going to go over the dialogue from the original unrevised script of Revenge of the Sith. You know, I find it always pretty interesting reading this one because you can find so many different things that George was thinking of putting in there, but you know, with the words of his advisors and his own choices, he decided to later cut it out of the final edit. However, today's will cover the scene where Anakin stands before the council just after speaking to Palpatine, who had unofficially appointed him his personal representative on the council and told him that he must go to Utapau to fight Grievous. Now personally, I think Palps knew the whole time that the council wouldn't allow Anakin to go, and this was what he was banking on. He knew it would anger him, swaying Anakin's allegiance more towards Palpatine himself, especially after their denial of his mission, and then not granting him the rank of master. So I'm going to read the script for you. He goes before the council and everyone basically votes for Kenobi to go and kill Grievous. Unanimously, as they all agree, Anakin pipes up to say, The Chancellor has requested that I lead the campaign. They all look at Anakin a bit disturbed. The council will make up its own mind who is to go, not the Chancellor. Yes, this decision is ours to make. Anakin is embarrassed, becomes sullen. A master is needed, one with more experience. Given our resources, I recommend we send only one Jedi, Master Kenobi. He was not so successful the last time he met Grievous. Oh, I don't think so. Obi-Wan throws Anakin a dirty look. No offense, Master, but I'm only stating a fact. Oh no, you're quite right, but I do have the most experience with his ways of combat. Hello there. Obi-Wan, my choice is. I concur. Master Kenobi should go. I agree. All the Jedi concur. Very well. Council is adjourned. Anakin is angry with the decision. Now I can kind of see why George and Lucasfilm took out this part. It's a bit brash for Anakin to straight up in front of the entire council throw shade at his master. Although it definitely would have shown more insight into how much he was changing at this time. The extreme internal conflict that was going on within Anakin was pretty much at this point fully baked. He was pretty much ready at this point to transform into Darth Vader. The only thing left was the events that took place in Palpatine's office. Every moment he became more twisted to the dark side by Palpatine's manipulation. In the novel, it's even worse. As Anakin was denied the rank of master, he was talking to himself in his head and thinking about attacking Mace, making fun of his fighting style and mocking him, essentially. Now you see, that's one battle that I wish we saw in the prequels, Anakin fighting Mace. 
I think that would have been really interesting and entertaining to see, as Anakin wasn't a dark side user just yet, and you see the way Mace's Vapod worked was that he would channel the dark side energy from his opponent back onto them, so he would use that energy and kind of use it as a cycle back onto them to fight them and kill them, so the more powerful his opponent, the more powerful his attacks became. This wouldn't work so well with Anakin because he wasn't fully into the dark side just yet and he would use his Jedi powers. So it would be a bit of a gray area for a fight outcome. I don't really know who would win. Who do you guys think would win in that battle? As we all know, Force Ghosts only apply to Jedi. They could transcend their consciousness into the next realm, into whatever physical shape they like. Some may appear as an orb, where others appear as their full form. Taught to Yoda by Qui-Gon Jinn from the other world, as quoted in the Revenge of the Sith novelization, the ultimate goal of the Sith, yet they can never achieve it. It comes only through the release of self, not the exaltation of self. It comes through compassion, not greed. Love is the answer to the darkness. So if this was applied only for Jedi, then how did Anakin Skywalker become a Force Ghost in Episode 6? That's what we will discuss in today's episode of Star Wars Theory. Now, according to Lucas, in Anakin's last few minutes alive on the Death Star, he was taught by Obi-Wan and Yoda how to transcend himself into the next dimension. If you watch Return of the Jedi, if you switch to the commentary, he briefly explains how he did it. However, if you know my videos, you know I like to go into detail. I found a passage from the book The Rise and Fall of Darth Vader. It explains our question today perfectly. I will now read you the passage verbatim. Closing his eyes as he slumped back against the shuttle ramp, Anakin Skywalker had every reason to believe that he was finally about to embrace perpetual darkness. Initially, there was darkness for Anakin Skywalker, a boundless shadowy realm like a universe without stars. But then, from somewhere at the edge of his awareness, he perceived a distant, shimmering light, then heard a voice say, Anakin. Although Anakin no longer had a body or a mouth which to speak, he somehow answered, Obi-Wan? Master, I'm so sorry, so very, very- Anakin, listen carefully, Obi-Wan interrupted, and Anakin was aware that the distant light was either growing brighter or closer, or perhaps both. You are in the netherworld of the Force, but if you ever wish to revisit corporal space, then I still have one thing left to teach you. A way to become one with the Force. If you choose this path to immortality, then you must listen now, before your consciousness fades. Knowing he was beyond redemption, Anakin said, But, Master, why me? Because you ended the horror, Anakin. Obi-Wan said, because you fulfilled the prophecy. The light was very bright now. Anakin's first thought was that he might be able to see his children again. He said, thank you, Master. Taking the Imperial shuttle, Luke Skywalker had escaped with his father's remains from the Death Star only a moment before the battle station exploded. After landing on the Sanctuary Moon, Luke prepared a very private funeral in a forest clearing. Night had fallen by the time Luke placed Anakin Skywalker's armor-clad body atop a pile of gathered wood. As he ignited the pyre, Luke said, I burn this armor and with it the name of Darth Vader. May the name of Anakin Skywalker be a light that guides the Jedi for generations to come. Luke was unaware of the spirits who watched him from the shadows of the Lambid Woods. But later, when he rejoined his allies for their victory celebration in the treetop village that was home to the Ewoks, Luke saw three shimmering apparitions materialize in the darkness. They were Obi-Wan Kenobi, Yoda, and his father, Anakin Skywalker. The Jedi had returned. It's interesting to think that after all that death, agony, and destruction, that Vader actually turned back into Anakin Skywalker and fulfilled his prophecy as the Chosen One. I'll also mention that in the expanded universe, Sidious taught Vader how to become a Force Ghost, just like the ancient Sith Lord Mark Aragnos. However, he was unable to complete his training on it due to his lack of knowledge. In Mandalorian Season 2, we learned a lot of new things. As Ahsoka enters the story and converses with Grogu, the child, we learn that he was raised at the Jedi Temple on Coruscant. Many masters trained him over the years, and at the end of the Clone Wars, he was actually hidden. Now as for him being hidden, I don't really know what that entails. Where was he hidden? Who hid him? Who found him after that? But what I can theorize on in this video are his parents, and it all comes from one little scene that you might not have noticed in the last episode of The Mando with Ahsoka. Now Grogu was lost and alone, so someone has taken his memory, and I think there are people there that could have taken him. I've mentioned before, maybe Mace Windu, maybe Jocasta Nu, or maybe even Palpatine himself. However, during Ahsoka's explanation to Din over the moonlight, she tells him that she's only met one like him before, mentioning the name Yoda. 
And right here is where we can see Grogu actually look at Ahsoka at the sound of the name. It's like he recognizes Yoda and knows who he is. Now a lot of you might be thinking, well hey, Ahsoka said that he was trained in the Jedi Temple by many masters over the years, up until the Clone Wars, so no doubt he knew who Yoda was. The Jedi Temple was huge, and during the time of the Clone Wars, there were tens of thousands of Jedi, not to mention younglings and others who were actually at the temple that weren't a Jedi. I doubt they knew who every single person or master was. Now, of course, Grandmaster Yoda was galaxy famous, but the way Grogu looks at her when she says his name was like he recognized an old friend, or maybe more, maybe a parent. And this is why I think there is a clear indication that Yoda could be the father, or at the very least in some way related. I mean look, this might be far-fetched, but hey, we've only really seen three Yoda species in Star Wars. Now I'm gonna mix some legends and lore into this video as well so you guys can understand a little bit where I'm going with how Grogu might have survived. Now many of you might say Jedi are forbidden to have kids, they're forbidden to form attachments. However, there were exceptions. Ki Adi Mundi was a Syrian, and his species were going extinct. This gave reason for the Jedi Council to approve his pursuit of multiple families. Hence, Kiadi Mundi having four wives in accordance to his species' answer to save their race from certain extinction. Maybe Yoda's species was so limited in population that this mandated him to mate with his species as a means of countering the extinction of their people. There was another of his species on the council, a female named Yadel. Now in Legends, and I've made a video on this three years ago, her story was cut short as she took her own life to save Anakin's. Yadel was a skilled Jedi Master with a rare Jedi power known as Maritro. This was an old ability that allowed her to slow her bodily functions down to the point of death. This could come in handy if you're poisoned, or something else I'm going to mention. There's always been a big debate between Yadel and Yoda as to which was stronger. While many say Yoda, there are some very big fans of Yadel who believe that she had surpassed the Grand Master before her untimely demise. Now in Legends, Yadel actually, like Yarael Poof, saved millions of people and primarily Anakin's life. Her demise can be read in the old Legends book Jedi Quest, Shadow Trap, which takes place about seven years after the Phantom Menace, or roughly three years before Attack of the Clones. Before I read the piece from the book, essentially what happened was, Yadel, Obi-Wan, and Anakin went to the war-torn world of Mawan on a diplomatic effort which ended up in stopping a massive bioweapon. Our story begins just as they finally get their hands on this weapon, and Yadel takes it into her possession atop a giant skyscraper. Here we go. Yadel hung above Anakin, above the tallest building of Natan, the force holding her temporarily aloft. She held a silver canister against her chest. No, he shouted, but he could already feel it. Yadel was drawing in the great net of the force she had created, drawing it around her so tightly and fiercely and strongly that Anakin fell to his knees. He had never felt the force move like this. He couldn't speak or move. From far below, Granta detonated the explosives. Anakin heard a sharp pop, nothing more. The force grew until Anakin was dazzled. Instead of exploding, the canister imploded, and Yadel drew the toxic gas and the explosive power in, absorbing it into her body. Then she simply disappeared. A shower of light particles swirled, hung in the air, then evaporated. Anakin's face was wet, tears flowed, and he did not feel them. The night sky was empty, and Jedi Master Yadel was dead. So I think with Yadel having sacrificed herself for Anakin, assuming they care to use this legend story, and if they don't, I'm gonna go into that too, maybe Anakin would see Grogu in the temple during Order 66, knowing that his mother saved him, if he is the child of Yadel, and there's a lot of ifs in this one, so it's probably never gonna happen. So let's say Anakin sees him in the temple, so he'll return the favor. Not by necessarily saving him, but maybe sparing him. Now the reason I don't think this could happen, just to play devil's advocate against my own theory, is that Anakin needed to kill the younglings. What a lot of people don't understand is that he didn't necessarily want to do those things. He forced himself to do them in order to have the power and the ability to save Padme. At least that's what Palpatine brainwashed him to believe. Now if he did let Grogu live, this would really change how we see Anakin and what he did during Order 66. Personally, I don't like it. I think Anakin needed to do those horrible things and fully dedicate himself to the dark side. 
Otherwise, it would just open up too much of changing the past and what he did. And Then there would be theories as to why he lost to Obi-Wan because he didn't have the full power of the dark side because he let Grogu live and all this and that. There would just be too many retcons and I just, I don't think it's a good theory. I don't, I don't even know why I'm making this video. But anyways, it, it made me think, so I'm like, hey, you know what? This could be an interesting possibility. I want to see what you guys think about it. Now, if they don't use this backstory, well, hey, Grogu's head turn at the mention of Yoda's name is enough for me to know that he obviously knew who the Grand Master was. And the Grand Master knew him, and of course, he knows that they are of the same species. This also raises another question for me. What if Yadel's story is different from Legends? Now, in Jedi Fallen Order, which is canon, there was an Easter egg about Yadel. And I know a lot of people say Yaddle, but I've been saying Yaddle since I was a little kid, so I'm just gonna keep rolling with it. Now in the game, she was mentioned by Grease, who said he had a dream, or has dreams, or people have dreams, that one day Yaddle will return. Could this possibly mean that she could return? Is it a little placeholder, a little foreshadowing maybe? Now look, I highly doubt that they're gonna use the same story from Legends that really no one knows about. However, if they do, it could lead into another story about Anakin saving Grogu. And again, Personally, I'm really not a fan of this, but it's just something I made up. While there's always the chance, I don't think they'll actually do it. I think with Yadel, they'll make it so that her leaving the Jedi Temple was for another purpose, as we mysteriously don't see her anymore in the movies after Episode 1. Now, movie canon and comic book legends theories aren't connected, especially with all the retcons. That being said, I do think things could change with Yadel's story in the sense that Jon Favreau and Dave Filoni could see that Yadel needs a story, and since there wasn't one told, at least properly in canon, they could just create one. Perhaps Yadel is on Tython or a nearby world, who knows. Either way, I think Grogu could be the love child of Yoda and Yadel, just like pretty much everyone think, but now you know, with the head turn, it at least lets you know that, of course, he did know who Yoda was. I guess we'll have to see for ourselves soon enough. In Revenge of the Sith, we see Anakin's pivotal turn in Palpatine's office. How he sacrificed Mace Windu in order to keep Palpatine alive, and thus learn his teachings of immortality. Throughout the trilogy, including the animated Clone Wars, we see the inner man Anakin is. Who he is at the core, if stripped of his force powers and weapons, and who he becomes. We see him as this gallant knight and protector of all things that are good in the galaxy, protector of children and all things of positive energy. So it leaves one confused how he just so randomly killed the younglings like it was a walk in the park, with no remorse whatsoever. Even after being told that he's going to be a father to his own child with Padme, he still walked into that room and ignited his weapon, callously. So how exactly does he do it so easily? And why, of all things, could he not have just let them go and not have told the Emperor? Let's examine this with a few sources, one of which being George Lucas himself, and the main one which will explain how he so easily killed them. It's a small dialogue from the novel The Dark Lord, The Rise of Darth Vader, which takes place after Revenge of the Sith, and is now, as you know, Legends. The setting is where Vader goes back to Coruscant to take over the now empty temple and turn it into Palpatine's headquarters and office, retrieving all the Sith holocrons. I hope you enjoy. Here we go. In his mind's eye, Vader saw his and the 501st's march to the temple gates, their wrathful attack, the mad moments of bloodlust, the dark side, unleashed in all its crimson fury. Some moments he remembered more clearly than others, pitting his blade against that of Swordmaster Sindrelic, beheading some of the very masters who had instructed him in the ways of the Force, and, of course, his cold extermination of the younglings, and with them, the future of the Jedi Order. He had wondered beforehand, could he do it? Still new to the dark side, would he be able to call upon its power to guide his hand and lightsaber? In answer, the dark side had whispered, they are orphans, they are without family or friends. There is nothing that can be done with them. They are better off, dead. But this recalling, weeks later, curdled his blood. This place should never have been built. So as we can see, as Vader remembers this moment vividly, he recalls that his initial reaction towards killing the younglings are shock and denial. However, once he started to imagine Padme dying, he knew what he had to do. As Palpatine said, Do not hesitate, show no mercy. This was a motto that helped fuel the Sith through their darkest decisions. I find Anakin felt some hesitation or doubt whether he could go through with it or not because the small grain of sand within Vader that was Anakin still gleamed time to time depending on the situation. 
It was also mentioned in the book that Vader's slaughter of the younglings is a major proponent in sealing his fate to the dark side. George Lucas himself has also said in interviews that Anakin knew he had to kill all the Jedi as Palpatine instructed, because if he didn't, then they would grow up to hunt them down and to possibly kill them later on down the road, which is exactly what happened with Luke, oddly enough. So the best thing to do was to kill them all right then and there, so as to leave no stone unturned. The last point I'd like to mention is that Anakin had initial practice for this very moment, and it was actually a foreshadowed scene that many of us may have missed if we now go back to Episode 2 and rewatch this and correlate it with what happened in Episode 3. And not just the men, but the women and the children too. They're like animals, and I slaughtered them like animals. I hate them! Many of you may think this was the reason Anakin can be seen crying to himself after his dark deeds are complete on Mustafar. That actually isn't the answer at all. That's something I'd like to dive deeper in for tomorrow's episode, if you so wish. Let me know in the comments. Also, let me know what you thought of Anakin's slaughter of the younglings. Was it written poorly in the films, or was it just bad directing? That's why I really like covering these videos, because it brings to light all the hidden things we didn't know about in the novelizations. Hey everybody, what is going on today? Hope you're all having a good day today so far. So today, I want to go over a question that was asked to me in my Instagram yesterday, and it's actually a pretty good one. What if there was no high ground? Who would have won? This is a question for the ages. The high ground, undoubtedly the most powerful, unstoppable force in the galaxy. But what if it didn't exist? What if Anakin, let's say, waited until the pod reached a little more down the volcanic beach, and then hopped onto land? climb up to Obi-Wan's level, and then fight him. Well, this video will combine not just my theory, but their fighting styles and force abilities to make an intelligent answer. So Anakin utilized Form 5. This is why he beat Dooku, using powerful aggressive strikes and always on the offensive. Obi-Wan used Form 3, Sorsu. He was the master of it, according to Mace Windu. He used this to fight Grievous with his many arms. It focused on tight blade work and always being used on the defensive. It was the perfect opponent for Anakin's fighting style. However, we all know here who the more gifted and powerful fighter was. Anakin, by natural talent, was the stronger being. Now, it's known fact that Obi-Wan was one of the least gifted Force users at the Jedi Temple. However, it was his unmatched dedication and practice that got him to where he was at that day. Which, to our surprise, was just as powerful as his younger apprentice, as we can see in their duel. Now, had Anakin trained even a few months longer with the dark side, maybe even a few weeks, it'd be game over. But we got what we got. At the time of the high ground, Obi-Wan was tiring out. He had to think of an exit strategy, and that's why he jumped to the high ground, instead of just continuing to use brute force like Anakin. And he was too confident on his new powers. Obi-Wan just jumped to the hill and ended it, in the same weird way that he killed Maul, who was overconfident in his abilities too. Now, if, let's say, there was no high ground, and Anakin just kept fighting along level ground forever, he would have eventually won. I fully believe that. Obi-Wan wasn't nearly in the same physical shape or age as Anakin was, nor were his abilities on par. He could defend and block for only so long until, you know, he'd eventually slip up, and then it would all be over. Now, all Anakin had to do here was wait for the pod to move along the riverbank, get to level ground, use force speed, and then continue their duel. He didn't, and it was his downfall. His overconfidence was his weakness. Which, if you guys know George's writing, you know he uses the same theme in prequels as he did in the originals. Anakin's defeat wasn't due to Obi-Wan being stronger or better than him, or even smarter, really. Anakin knew the disadvantage of the low ground. It's not like he didn't. He studied his master's attacks against Darth Maul, and he saw this as a challenge to prove himself, thinking that his powers in the dark side now were more than anyone in the galaxy. And ultimately, it led to his failure. Now, in terms of what would have happened to the galaxy if Anakin didn't lose, well, I've done that video a few times over, so you guys can check that out. But if you want, I can always cover it again, maybe in a different theme. I'm thinking the next video I want to cover is what if Yoda and Sidious fought in an open arena? That would be a little bit different. Who would win in that case? Kind of like how Hulk and Thor fought. All right, so normally this is something you'd expect to find in the behind the scenes books or making of type of books. However, it's not even in there. This was actually sent to me by a fan in an email just a couple days ago, and it's something that I always overlooked. 
Let's just get to the point. Anakin full on screams out to Padme while the mask is being sealed to his face for the first time at the end of episode 3. We see his mouth start to move even through his burnt and leathered skin, forcing air out of his burnt lungs one last time, without the help of his synthesizer. Now I don't want to get copyrighted or anything obviously, but if you find the clip on YouTube or play it back on your TV, you will notice that he's saying something and it sounds a lot like, Padme, help me as the mask is being put on and sealed. The voice sounds muffled like it would if you were talking to a voice proof helmet being attached to your face. Okay, so this is me now editing while I'm editing the actual video. I'm gonna post the clip. If I get copyrighted, you know, I'm taking one for the team, so at least just hit like on this video, help me out. I've added some modulators to it so you can hear the muffled voice as close as, you know, humanly possible here. Obviously, if some people are better with uh, sound editing, please be my guest, go ahead. However, it even sounds like Hayden Christensen. So, here we go, guys. This was the last bit of Anakin that we will ever see on screen, just as he's sealed into the mask forever. And I think the symbolism is really deep. This is something you have to really look deep into, otherwise, you know, it's not really gonna be something that you can figure out or hear on the first screening. Now, one thing I do wanna mention before we go a little more into detail about this and what it means is basically, Anakin was unable to speak. So the voice that we heard at the end of Return of the Jedi was as good as it's gonna get but especially right after Mustafar, which was that point here, he could barely speak more than a whisper. So anything that he would say, it would sound like this, and it would almost sound very, very painful to talk. Because his entire vocal cords were burnt and scorched, and therefore, it's gonna make it really hard to talk. Now, what does this mean? What's the symbolism here? It's actually really beautiful. It shows that he's trapped. He can't be heard, his emotions and true identity was always screaming out for help, but it was the all new life that was symbolized within this black suit of death that Sidious put him into, which made him the machine that he became. This is definitely one of the biggest topics or hidden topics that I could make a video on, especially after the help me line that was cut from the Mustafar scene, which I did a video on a couple months back, I believe. It is so subtle, but you can definitely hear him screaming something on the inside, and it sounds a lot like Padme help me, or help me Padme. So let me know what you The council is no longer in control. We would be honored if you would join us. One of the most dramatic scenes in all of Star Wars, and one of the most dark. When Palpatine orders Anakin to storm the temple and kill all of the Jedi, to do what must be done. While I've done videos on the reason Anakin killed the younglings, today's video will be the most voted topic from last night's poll on Facebook. How did Anakin kill all the Jedi at the temple during Order 66? The answer is complex and not as straightforward as one may think. I've managed to break it down into six detailed points. First, let's do some math and backtrack. During the Battle of Genosis in Episode 2, there were roughly 200 to 250 Jedi in the arena fighting the droids. While that number is not official, I did pause the movie and do my best to count how many Jedi there were. Many of them were killed by the droid's robotic blaster fire, and we should note that the Jedi were ready for the attack, fully focused and aware of who was the enemy. During the Purge, however, they were not. This leads us to our first point. As Palpatine said, We will catch them off balance. The Jedi were completely taken by surprise. Imagine it like this. You're at home, and your best friend knocks at your door with a group of your other close friends. Then, they beat you up. You wouldn't have expected that, would you? Anakin was the poster boy of the Jedi Council, and the hero of the Clone Wars. He was the chosen one, and everyone knew how gifted he was. We can see the reaction of the younglings when they saw Anakin. They ran to him for protection, only to be slaughtered like animals. And I slaughtered them like animals. It's unfortunate we didn't get to see the events during the raid on the Jedi Temple. However, I will make a separate video later on discussing Anakin's entire thoughts from the novelization during Order 66 at the Temple. The second point is that most of the Masters were already killed by Sidious or away on other planets. I think there are only two Jedi that Anakin would lose to, and those were Masters Yoda and Windu. Even Count Dooku, who stood his ground against his former master, Yoda, lost to Anakin as soon as he started using his hatred and tapped into the dark side. That right there is a giveaway to gauge just how talented Anakin was at dueling. With Obi-Wan on Utapau, Yoda on Kashyyyk, and Mace Windu out of the picture, along with his strike force, this left the temple very vulnerable. 
The third point I'd like to make is something that loses the attention of many when we talk about clones. The clones were genetically engineered fighting machines, and not just replicas of a regular man or mercenary, but the number one most ruthless Jedi hunter in the galaxy for two generations, Jango Fett and then Boba, who was a direct clone of Jango. The clones were gifted genetically, and if that wasn't already enough, they had their entire accelerated life of training protocols and combat experience from Jango's methods personally. Order 66 was planned during their conception and was hinted to Jango by Count Dooku when he pitched the idea of cloning him for an army. On top of all this, these were the 501st Legion of clone troopers. They were top tier, the best of the best, and the most ruthless. These were the clones that gained the reputation of Vader's fist. They spent years fighting next to the Jedi in the Clone Wars, learning their tactics and techniques, and in the end, using it to their advantage to execute Order 66. The fourth point is the strategy used by the clones only. We'll cover Anakin's after as it isn't as elaborate. The strategy implanted by the inhibitor chip for Order 66 combined all of Jango's Jedi killing knowledge with the added tactic of teamwork. The clones knew the Jedi, unless a very powerful master, of course, they wouldn't be able to deflect an overwhelming load of blaster fire for too long of a time, especially if they were Padawans or just low-level knights even. They would attack in groups and focus their firepower at the chest of the Jedi and collectively shoot until one blast got through, leading the rest to continue to shoot and attack like piranhas after. This is exactly how they were even able to kill Jedi Master ki -Adi mundi The fifth point we'll examine is Anakin Skywalker in general. When he entered the temple, he thrust his saber directly through Master Jorok's skull. He then killed Jocasta Nu, the librarian who was also a master. I want access to the temple signal beacon. On whose authority? By order of the Supreme Chancellor. That is not within the Chancellor's power. Only the Jedi Council can authorize access. The Council is no longer in control. You won't get away with this, Skywalker! In the Clone Wars, we can see Anakin kill Shock T in Yoda's vision. What is it, Skywalker? Let's also examine this video here. I've slowed it down for us to analyze Anakin's fighting style during the raid. Here, he is literally fending off Sindrelic, who is a very talented swordsman and master of the academy, with one hand. Extremely relaxed, as if it's just a walk in the park, while his other hand is choking the life out of a Padawan. Anakin had outranked everyone at the temple, which leads us to our sixth and final point. There was a reason Sidious didn't execute Order 66 at an earlier time. It's because he was waiting for the perfect moment to do it, when the Jedi were spread thin and scattered throughout the galaxy. He knew if they were together, then most likely they would have won. However, if they were taken by surprise, caught off balance, and alone, then his plans would come to fruition. He was the first to fully seek out Darth Bane's Rule of Two by hiding in the shadows and striking the Jedi when they least expected it. Palpatine was the true leader of this operation. Only now, at the end, do you understand? What did you think of the raid on the Jedi Temple? Do you think things would have been different if Yoda and Obi-Wan were back at the temple? Hey guys, do you all remember this video that I made a little while ago? Well, to my surprise, it did blow up. This is outrageous. And rightfully so, I guess. It's a huge piece that no one noticed in the final cut that we all got in Revenge of the Sith. Now, this video is an addition to that one in why George actually took that part out. It's discussed in the book The Making of Revenge of the Sith, where George discusses the final scene. Now, if you haven't seen that video, go watch it. I'll have it pop up at the end of this one. However, I'm going to briefly reiterate what it was about. It took place at the end of the Mustafar battle, where Anakin bursts into flames, or rather just before. He asks for Obi-Wan to help him, where Obi-Wan refuses and tells him that he loves him, but he cannot help him. Which is true. I mean, he literally killed all the Jedi through Order 66, including younglings. It doesn't really get much worse than that, and I don't see how Obi-Wan could help him. Anyways, George, just before filming, goes up to Ewan McGregor, who plays Obi-Wan, if you don't know, and, well, here's the piece from the book itself. Production moves on to Obi-Wan's new line just before he slices off Anakin's limbs. To prep him, Lucas shows McGregor the edited sequence on one of the monitors. I cut out Anakin's line. Help me, master, he explains. I didn't want him to be redeemed. 
But the end stays like that, he asks, referring to the sequence as a whole. Yeah. Now, the removal of that line is very important, and that's why I'm making this video. If he hadn't removed it, then Anakin would have forever had the idea of being redeemed, and we could blame Obi-Wan for not choosing to help him, which would have just possibly gone down a very different path. One which I explored in a very different and long two-part fanfiction discussing what if Obi-Wan had saved Anakin at the end of Revenge of the Sith. Now, this is interesting to me in the sense that it closes any possible notion of him ever having second thoughts about the dark side by asking for help. And the fact that it closes any conversation about Obi-Wan now having a full-on chance at saving Anakin. I'm happy George made this decision, because if he didn't, then it would have looked like Anakin actually regretted what he did, in which he did when he was crying, we can see that, and George actually even says that in the deleted scenes too. However, now, in this scene, after losing to Obi-Wan like that, it just feels out of character for Anakin to ask for forgiveness and to be helped by Obi-Wan. At this moment, he is engulfed in rage, and that's what keeps him alive. So, I think it's very true to Anakin's character and Darth Vader's character as a whole after his completed transformation once he lost to Obi-Wan. I thought it'd be cool to show George's final words on not wanting Anakin to be redeemed and explaining them a little bit in my theories and thoughts. So let me know, do you think Anakin's line should have been left in there, or are you happy George took it out? Hey everyone, how are you all doing today? Welcome back to another video. Today we're going to cover some ships, particularly Anakin's Jedi Starfighter. Now just prior to the onset of the Clone Wars, the Delta VII Aether Sprite class light interceptor, or just the Delta VII Aether Sprite light interceptor, was commissioned. However, due to the fact that it was most often used by the Jedi, it became more commonly known as the Jedi Starfighter. This highly effective but expensive small interceptor was made of the state-of-the-art technology of its time. With a sophisticated sensor array and communication systems, along with the Starfighter's two twin laser cannons, which were later supplemented by an additional four quad-pulse laser cannons, concealed behind the ship's breakaway panels, thanks to the modification added to its design by Jedi Master Seizy Tin, the Delta VII made for a sleek and deadly opponent to deal with, especially if its pilot was a Jedi. It was designed by Walix Blissex the engineer doctor general who, during the time of the Empire, would together with one of the Rebel Alliance's first generals, Jan Dodona, work on the RZ-1 A-Wing Interceptor. The Delta Sevens was fast, with extremely powerful sunlight engines that could accelerate up to 5,000 Gs, but due to its size and the technology of the day, the Jedi Starfighter, with a few experimental prototypes as exceptions, was unable to carry an internal hyperdrive. So, to reach light speed, the Interceptor had to rely on an external hyperdrive docking ring system. Unlike the future Starfighters to come, like the T-65 X-Wing, the first generation of Delta Sevens didn't allow for a full-size astromech droid navigator. So instead, the droid was directly integrated into the Jedi fighter, leaving the astromech's head the only thing that was visible. Due to how fast the Starfighter moved, it was nearly impossible for most pilots to actually hit their targets. That's where R3D came in. A droid whose function was primarily to be the ship's targeting system, while R4P was mainly utilized for navigation. However, with the introduction of the Delta 7B, full factory model astromechs were eventually able to be used as navigators. Now the interceptors were given different color markings. Turquoise was used for general use Jedi starfighters, while red was assigned to specific Jedi. Though other hues of colors soon emerged, as some Jedi chose to individualize their ships, such as Anakin Skywalker who painted his fighter, the Azure Angel, similar to the look of his pod racer on Tatooine. But because Skywalker was Skywalker, he also heavily modified the craft, installing an experimental built-in hyperdrive and adding large turbine engines. There were even some rare interceptors that had a forward sonic mine or seismic charge that could unleash a devastating shockwave. Or, instead, in the rear, the ship was given a bomb chute. But again, those modifications were very rare. One of the most prominent and iconic moments for the Delta VII was shortly before the Battle of Genosis, when Jedi Master Obi-Wan Kenobi was attacked by the notorious bounty hunter Jango Fett in his Slave One. After the Jedi Master had tracked the infamous killer to an asteroid field en route to the planet Albicus, but it was really Obi-Wan's Padawan, Anakin, who took the Starfighter to heart. Literally in any way, as Azur Angel was named after Senator Padme Amidala, the young Padawan's secret wife. 
Skywalker kept modifying his craft, so along with the increased power to the engine, to the articulated stabilizer, and the vectored thrusters for superior maneuverability in space and in atmospheric flight, Anakin also mounted two tame and back laser cannons to each of the Azure's wingtips, totaling four in all. But of course he wasn't done. In the center fuselage, he also installed a missile launcher that contained a high volume of missiles, and the tame and back laser cannons could also be fired all at once or individually, depending on the situation. They could even hit their targets at extreme off-axis angles, while the heavily modified Jedi starfighter swooped by its enemies. Then with this missile launcher, the young Jedi could launch them in rapid succession, as he did at the Battle of Munalist, where he fired within only a span of a few seconds, seven of them. And if that wasn't enough, Anakin also had a pair of Transgalmeg hyperdrive thrusters that were used to bypass the use of the hyperdrive ring. However, there were some Jedi that wanted to spoil Anakin's fun, as they were concerned that he thought of the Azure Angel as his own possession, and saw his modifications as yet another example of his inability to let go of his attachments. However, not all agreed. Jedi Master Seizi Tin, who had made his own modifications to the overall design of the Delta VII, encouraged the inventive Padawan to keep going, to test where the limits of the Jedi Starfighter could be, as he hoped Skywalker's improvements could prove useful in the design of the next generation of the Interceptor. Unfortunately, the original Azure Angel met an unfortunate end by Count Dooku's dark acolyte, Asajj Ventress. This was after Anakin had chased her to the jungle moon of Yavin 4, where, after he landed, she destroyed it. Anakin fortunately defeated the dark side assassin in a ferocious duel that they had throughout the jungle, and he would go on to pilot several other starfighters throughout the Clone Wars, including at least two yellow ETA-2 Actus, a red Delta-7, a number of yellow Delta-7Bs, and another blue Delta-7 named Azure Angel 2. Hope you enjoyed this video on all or at least most of Anakin's ships that he used frequently. Hey guys, in this episode I want to cover something pretty interesting, and something that was supposed to give us a very different feel to the whole high ground scene in Revenge of the Sith. So remember when Obi-Wan sliced Anakin into pieces? Anakin was full of rage and hate in that scene, and he was set in his path to kill the Jedi, never asking for help or forgiveness or anything, right? Well, according to the making of Star Wars Revenge of the Sith, Anakin was actually supposed to beg Obi-Wan to save him, to help him. This puts a totally different feel on the scene, because now we have Anakin asking for help and forgiveness. Even if for but a moment, it still shows he was never fully committed to the dark side. Or it shows his treachery that he was going to use Obi-Wan's help to somehow kill him or throw him in the lava. Now personally, I think this is the moment that Anakin could have been swayed back to the light. I mean, there's more chance at this moment than any other, really. So here's the direct write-up from the book. Revenge of the Sith deleted scene, a cry for help. The scene where Obi-Wan defeats Anakin was originally slightly longer and included additional dialogue between the two men. After everything that happened between them on Mustafar, and after everything Anakin has done, Obi-Wan's first impulse is to reach out to help the man who became his brother, and Anakin's first impulse is to reach out to Obi-Wan for help. Anakin's cry for help, together with his outstretched hand, is actually left intact in the movie, even though the sound was muted. You can see Hayden Christensen's lips clearly pronouncing the words. Christensen groans to get into character, and then gives an emotional delivery of the two lines. Help me, master, and I hate you. The making of Star Wars Revenge of the Sith by J.W. Rinsler documents the filming of that dialogue, and there is actual behind-the-scenes footage where Obi-Wan refuses to help the fallen Jedi. It's only then that Anakin's eyes turn from blue to Sith red. This revelation adds a new dimension to the scene and makes it even more heartbreaking. I love you, but I can't help you. According to this book, after Anakin implores Obi-Wan to save him, George Lucas asked Ewan McGregor to say, I will not. Softer, almost to himself, because after Anakin bursted into flames, it's as if Obi-Wan was talking to a dead person. That's why he also suggested to drive home this point, that McGregor changed the words in the script to the past tense. I loved you. Ewan agreed, but pointed out that his subsequent line would have to change to, but I could not help you. Lucas also explained that what Obi-Wan is basically saying to Anakin is, you were my only hope. You blew it, now we don't have any hope. So this adds a whole new dimension of feelings for that scene. Anakin was asking for help, and this was the moment that I feel he could have been saved. Obi-Wan declined, you know, rightfully so, he did a lot of wrongs in this case and thus cementing his path to the dark side forever. But it makes you think, 
what if he actually did save him? This kind of takes you back to my fanfiction where I did two parts of what if Obi-Wan saved Anakin. That would have completely changed the timeline and if you haven't checked it out, do check it out. It was one of my favorites to make and I think it holds a lot of truth for what could have happened here. However, Star Wars wouldn't be what it is today if that did. Now of course the new hope was Luke Skywalker but they don't really know that till much later. Hey everyone, how are you all doing today? So I've never done this video because I figured it was pretty obvious, but one of the things I overlook is that not everyone has seen the movies a million times, and things get left out. So this video is for all of you who have asked this in the comments plenty of times. Anakin Skywalker has always used a blue lightsaber. Blue is indicative of a guardian status. Now green, as we've seen with Qui-Gon and Yoda, means that person is really strong with the Force, otherwise known as a consular. In episode 2, at the end in the Genosian arena, we see Anakin using a green lightsaber, and it raises the question as to just why he had a green one, then went back to blue in the final prequel episode. What many might have forgotten is that Anakin's real official blue lightsaber got destroyed in the Genosian factory. It gets squashed and no longer works. Then he gets captured by the Genosians with Padme and Obi-Wan, where he still doesn't have a lightsaber at this point, because it's destroyed. However, once the Jedi arrive, then Obi-Wan and Anakin are given spare lightsabers to defend themselves by two Jedi. Now, what is curious, and we could, you know, have some fun with a theory on it, is that they knew they had to give Anakin and Obi-Wan new lightsabers, considering they were captured and their holder probably wouldn't leave them with their weapon. So why didn't they grab two blue ones to return the order of what they both wielded? Why one green, signifying force power expertise, and one as a guardian? The Council knew Anakin had the highest midichlorian count in the known galaxy, so perhaps whoever picked these out to give to him knew the green one should be given to Anakin. This raises my theory that if Qui-Gon still trained Anakin, would he have given him a green lightsaber this early in the game? Because he knew how powerful he was, or could have been had he trained properly in the Force. Would his Force powers be that much more advanced and therefore require or rather grant him the use of a green lightsaber? I think that's a pretty interesting question for sure, but more than likely it's just random and George thought it would be cool to switch things up for this temporary saber, harnessing a green crystal. Now I have done a video on why Anakin doesn't use a green lightsaber in episode 3. If you guys want, I'll have it pop up at the end of this video and you can check it out in the last 20 seconds. But I hope this answers that question that it wasn't actually Anakin's lightsaber since his was destroyed, so these were just temporary lightsabers and he ended up using this one and Obi-Wan's temporary blue one against Dooku, which of course the green one got destroyed and the blue one, we don't really know what happened to it, but Yoda probably picked it up and put it back into storage or their spare lightsaber section. We never do really see it again. So this is one of those questions that you don't really hear asked, but you just know that you can't be the only one wondering. Well, for this too, we have an answer. The Jedi were keepers of the peace, not soldiers. They believed in democracy and that the Jedi should have a choice in how they live their lives. However, when it came to the Jedi Order, they had different criteria. Some might say they were controlling, while others believed it was a way of the Order and unification. While almost every other Jedi Master can be seen wearing light-colored robes made from the same materials, reflecting their calming and positive nature, the Black Duck stands out, and that is none other than Anakin Skywalker. If we dismiss the fact that there were a few other Jedi with dark-colored robes, such as Luminara Unduli and Ahsoka, and even Quinlan Vos, we can notice that it's not just Anakin's robes, but his entire tunic and outfit that is dark as well. Then we can just focus on Anakin's rebellion to conform towards the Jedi's color scheme. Let's refer to the visual dictionary from episode 2 for our answer. As we land on Anakin's profile, by the way this book is really cool, as we land on Anakin's profile we get all the info we need from Lucas and his team. I mean obviously we can figure out what Lucas was doing, but if we stick to the story for the fun of it, then we can finally understand officially why he wore these colors, and the materials he specifically used. Let's start from the top with the dead giveaway. The unconventional tunic color expresses Anakin's independence. That alone is enough for this video's answer, but we have much more info. Next to it points to his tunic material. Synthetic leather surcoat offers more protection than traditional cloth garments. Why would Anakin feel he needs to wear this material when masters like Yoda and Mace Windu or even Qui-Gon Jinn didn't? It's because he was ready to fight at all times and confrontation was at the forefront of his mind. He obsessed over it, reflecting on his clothing choices down to the material to be ready at all times. The third and final point shows Anakin's clothing heading. Dark Knight. The tunic, robes, and cloaks worn by Jedi are honored traditions, but not uniforms. Oh, wait, one second. 
There we go. That's better. From the time they become Padawans, Jedi are free to dress as they choose. Anakin Skywalker breaks with tradition in his garments, both in their color and material. His distinctive dark clothing makes him stand out at the Jedi Temple, and draws concern from Jedi Elders. So while his robes are his to choose, meaning he can literally wear hot pink robes How can or lime green or whatever he wants, it didn't stop the Masters from becoming concerned with his clothing choice, reflecting back onto his personality and striking a red flag early on in his Jedi career. Just another reason why Mace Windu was always doubtful in his sincerity. I always felt like the subtleties to Anakin, such as his scar and the color of his robes that strayed away from the Jedi Order, was really what pronounced his turn to the dark side, and the fact that he was different in nature altogether. Much more powerful, much more talented, and much more rebellious. So why did Anakin lose to the high ground? Well, because it was the high grounds. Thanks for watching, guys. Have no, I'm just kidding. In today's video, we're going to discuss the reasons Anakin lost to the high ground while covering some basic canon comics for our answer. So with all the jokes about the high ground being the impenetrable form of attack, I have an army. We have a Hulk. I have the high ground. Spawning a universe full of hilarious memes and jokes, it's led me to analyze just why the high ground was so amazing. And it's not just because it was at a higher elevation, it actually requires some knowledge from the Anakin and Obi-Wan comics for this answer. The one in particular is this one, where Anakin fights a droid simulated to look and fight just like Darth Maul. As the story pans to the balcony above as Palpatine, Mace Windu, and Obi-Wan observe the young Padawan's impressive abilities, they realize that Anakin is fighting a Darth Maul simulator, as Obi-Wan tells them that he has pestered him non-stop about his fight with the Sith. Anakin knew exactly how Obi-Wan defeated him, and it's no coincidence that the final battle between Master and Apprentice, the soon-to-be Darth Vader, ended in such a poetic way, paying homage to the defeat of the first Sith Lord to show himself within a thousand years. Only this time, Obi-Wan allowed the spawn of the most potentially powerful Sith to corrupt and carry out the Emperor's bidding. It's pretty cool if you look at it in this poetic way. Anakin had a big inferiority complex. He always wanted to beat Obi-Wan to prove he was more powerful than his master, and always one step ahead of him. In the Revenge of the Sith novel, during his denial to be granted the rank of master, Anakin challenged Mace Windu in his mind, playing out a little fight until Obi-Wan snapped him out of his daydream, just standing there, which is when he bows and takes a seat. He also always compared himself to Yoda, as we saw in Episode 2, when he thought he rivaled the Grand Jedi in lightsaber combat. This moment for Skywalker was a way to say he was better than Obi-Wan, not just because Obi-Wan had the advantage for the higher ground, but because it was how Obi-Wan killed Maul when he was around the same age as Anakin. This was a last stab at his master that he was just as if not better than him. How he could do the same thing as him and win. That this move that caused his and the Jedi Order's victory against the Sith will now be the downfall of the Order entirely. Anakin was going to cut his master in half like Maul, so it was fitting that Obi-Wan defended himself in such a way. He could feel the malevolence in Anakin's energy. The hatred at this point was too strong within Anakin. It's all Obi-Wan's fault. He's jealous. He's holding me back! He blamed Obi-Wan for holding him back this entire time and using him as a scapegoat for his mother's death, for the death of Padme, and for him not becoming a master on the council. So for that reason, fueled by rage and arrogance, of course, as well, he leapt. However, his calculations were too short and it cost him his fate of eternal suffering. Anakin was a brilliant Jedi, as smart and battle savvy as he was in the Clone Wars. He knew the best plan of attack was to wait and cross at a distance slightly further down the river bank, but he didn't. He was clouded by his arrogance, and it led to his rise as the masked Darth Vader. It's too bad for Anakin, Obi-Wan had mastered the high ground and the low ground. Another happy landing. When it comes to who was stronger, well, that's not a debate for this video. However, I do believe that Anakin was more powerful, potentially. However, their force powers were almost identical as we saw when they repelled one another back during their duel. What did you think of his demise? Was it fitting to the story or rushed? Did you read the comic that I mentioned and did it ever make you think, hmm, was Anakin trying to emulate that same move from his master's fight? This video originally started as a theory, however, I checked with the novelization of The Revenge of the Sith for this scene in particular, just to see how far off I was. It turns out, the book confirms my thoughts. 
So in this video, I will read a passage from the novelization of The Revenge of the Sith regarding Anakin's rejection of becoming a master. Then I'll explain everything in detail. You'll notice how much the films cut out in comparison to the book. Let's begin. Finally, as it began to sink in upon him, as he gradually allowed himself to understand that the Council had finally decided to grant him his heart's desire, that they finally had recognized his accomplishments, his dedication, his power, he took a slow, deep breath. Thank you, Masters. You have my pledge that I will uphold the highest principles of the Jedi Order. Allow this appointment lightly. The Council does not. Yoda's ears curled forward at Anakin like accusing fingers. Disturbing is this move by Chancellor Palpatine. Anakin inclined his head. I understand. I'm not sure you do. Mace Windu leaned forward, staring into Anakin's eyes with a measuring squint. Anakin was barely paying attention. In his mind, he was already leaving the council chamber, riding the turbo lift to the archives, demanding access to the restricted vault by authority of his new rank. You will attend to the meetings of this council the Corrin Master said, but you will not be granted the rank and privileges of a Jedi Master. What? It was a small word, a simple word, an instinctive recoil from words that felt like punches, like stun blasts exploding inside his brain that left his head ringing and the room spinning around him. But even to his own ears, the voice that came from his lips didn't sound like his own. It was deeper, darker, clipped and oiled, resonating from the depths of his heart. It didn't sound like him at all, and it smoked with fury. How dare you! Anakin stood welded to the floor, motionless. He wasn't even truly aware of speaking. It was as if someone else was using his mouth, and now, finally, he recognized the voice. It sounded like Dooku, but it was not Dooku's voice. It was the voice of Dooku's destroyer. No Jedi in this room can match my power. No Jedi in the galaxy. You think you can deny mastery to me? The Chancellor's representative you are, Yoda said. And it is as his representative you shall attend the council. Sit in this chamber you will, but no vote will you have. Up from the depths of his furnace heart came an answer so far transcending fury that it sounded cold as interstellar space. This is an insult to me and to the Chancellor. Do not imagine that it will be tolerated. Mace Windu's eyes were as cold as the voice from Anakin's mouth. Take a seat, young Skywalker. Anakin matched his stare. Perhaps I'll take yours. His own voice inside his head had a hot black fire that smoked from the depths of his furnace heart. You think you can stop me from saving my love? You think you can make me watch her die? Go ahead and vapod this, you- Anakin, Obi-Wan said softly. He gestured to an empty seat beside him, please. And something in Obi-Wan's gentle voice, in his simple, straightforward request, sent his anger slinking off ashamed, and Anakin found himself alone on the carpet in the middle of the Jedi Council, blinking. He suddenly felt very young and foolish. Forgive me, Master. His bow of contrition couldn't hide the blaze of embarrassment that climbed his cheeks. We have surveyed all systems in the Republic. But are found the rest of the session passed in a haze. So, as we can see, Anakin was already thinking of taking Windu's spot on the Council. As dark as that sounds in itself, it confirms his actions later on and how he could so easily betray Mace in the Chancellor's office. That's a different video for a different time. In the context of this video, Anakin wanted to become a master for two reasons. One was because, well, as we know, he was egotistical, always obsessed with ranking, such as his obsession with becoming a Jedi as a little boy, to later becoming a Jedi Master in Episode 3. The second and the biggest reason he wanted the promotion was to gain access to the Sith holocrons and scrolls in the restricted section. The restricted section allowed entry only to masters, and since Anakin wasn't one yet, he couldn't get in there. After Palpatine told him about the Sith legend of Darth Plagueis the Wise, it spiked Anakin's interest about the Sith and their teachings. Even before this, we can see his obsession with understanding all aspects of the Force in this scene here. I know there are things about the Force that they're not telling me. They don't trust you, Anakin. 
A little quick history lesson about the Jedi Temple itself. It was actually a Sith shrine over 4,000 years ago in this timeline. And what happened was, as the Sith killed each other, and through wars having died out, the four masters, who were the Jedi masters of the temple at that time, came to Coruscant and built the temple upon the Sith shrine as a way to block out the Sith teachings. This also leads to many theories about why the dark side clouded the Jedi's judgment so much through the films. The second part of this video that I'll have pop up at the end of this is a fan fiction that goes through my theory and thoughts of what would have happened if Anakin had been granted the rank of master. I truly believe that if he was, then he never would have turned to the dark side since he'd have full access to all the Sith teachings, instead of just Palpatine's info from Darth Plagueis. If we incorporated Legends material, then Anakin could have studied many Sith who cheated death both in life and after, such as the immortal Sith God and Dedu, Marco Regnos and Valkorion, to name a few. Do you think Anakin would have turned to the dark side even if he did have access to the restricted section in the Jedi Archives? Let me know below. This video will cover two different topics. We will first start with Palpatine. In Revenge of the Sith, and all of the prequel trilogy films for that matter, we see Palpatine has his regular human eyes instead of his infamous bright yellow eyes. Why is this? It's expected that the most powerful Sith Lord would have his Sith yellow eyes at all times. However, why do his eyes remain normal before the execution of Order 66? The answer is because golden yellow eyes for a Sith only happen at certain moments in their lives when the dark side is the most strong within them. When they have just summoned the most amount of evil that they could and brought it out, were they seen with the most terrifying, ominous yellow eyes. Prior to Order 66, Palpatine was working to move under the radar of the Jedi to complete his plan and become the Supreme Chancellor, then the Emperor, and persuade Anakin to become his apprentice in the Dark Side of the Force. He subdued almost all of his Dark Side powers up until the end of the fight with Mace Windu, where he unleashed the full power of the Dark Side as we saw, shouting unlimited power and holding nothing back. This for Palpatine was like a release of holding it in for so many years, waiting to finally unleash his pent up rage and letting the hatred flow strongly through him, bringing Mace to his end. It was after this that his eyes began to glow an ember yellow as he knighted Darth Vader, killing Anakin almost entirely. His eyes remained yellow because he was, after all, the Sith Lord and the most powerful in the galaxy. We can see them glow even more as he ignites his hatred while killing Luke in Episode 6, drawing more and more upon the dark side of the Force. The same can be said for Anakin, just as Palpatine said when he told him, Show no mercy. Only then will you be strong enough with the dark side. Only once he raided the Jedi Temple would he be able to feel the full power of the dark side and call upon it. This is why we don't see Anakin's eyes change for the first time until after he slaughters the Separatists on Mustafar, <laughs> completing his full turn to the dark side. Then once Padme arrives, his energy completely changes to a more subdued level and he returns to his original normal eyes. Most would think that his eyes would change when he was killing the younglings, however, he was acting in revenge and hate against politicians that he never had respect for. This is the opposite to the raid on the temple and the slaughter of the younglings, when his eyes were blue instead of yellow. When he attacked the Jedi, he was in a similar mental state to Kylo Ren, for example, who confronted Han Solo. He had to kill people he knew, loved, and built relationships with. Ultimately, something he knew in his heart was wrong. Calling upon the full power of the dark side again when he was on the brink of death at the lava bank, bursting into flames and using his physical and emotional pains to fuel his survival. This is why we see his eyes remain yellow behind the mask in Rebels. All the way up until Luke helped bring him back to the light side of the Force at the time of his death in Return of the Jedi. Hey everyone, we've all seen that part in Episode 3 where Anakin has just helped Palpatine kill Mace Windu by slicing his hand off, and was knighted as Darth Vader, joining the ranks as Darth Sidious' apprentice and fulfilling Darth Bane's ancient rule of two. After this scene, we hear Palpatine tell Anakin, Every single Jedi, including your friend Obi-Wan Kenobi, is now an enemy of the Republic. 
We must move quickly. The Jedi are relentless. If they are not all destroyed, it will be civil war without end. Which means that if the Jedi, including the younglings, learned about this betrayal, they could have informed senators such as Bail Organa, and there would be civil war. Inevitably, of course, Bail did see what was happening, and despite Palpatine's plans, a war did eventually break out. It was the will of the Force that the Jedi Order be wiped out of existence to the last Padawan. Their crime? Swearing allegiance to the Galactic Senate, placing the will of the people over the will of the Force. Even when the will of the people was corrupted by politics or fear, defining good as the common good and not the will of the Force itself. Only Qui-Gon Jinn followed the Force, like religion. He let the Force guide his actions. All other Jedi were sworn to use the Force according to the will of the people and the Council. To use the Force against its will, essentially. Even the Padawans. So on the surface, if you're not an in-depth Star Wars fan, the reason for Anakin to kill the Jedi was to distinguish any possible flare of Jedi in the future to uprise and hunt them down in the shadows and foil any of their plans to come. But why the younglings? They were so insignificant. If you watch the commentary during that scene, Lucas dubs that Anakin had to kill them in case one of those kids came back later to get them. There's another reason that only fans will know, and we're going to go over that one next. Anakin was no stranger to letting his hatred consume him. The big thing about the dark side is that once you slip and allow yourself to be fully consumed by it, turning back is no easy move. Also, a big thing to remember is that he was simultaneously terrified of losing Padme. He just got a front row demonstration of the power of the dark side. By agreeing to be Palpatine's apprentice, he was agreeing to carry out his orders 100% or face a punishment far worse than death for himself and his loved ones. This isn't the first time he has killed innocent children. I killed them all. They're dead. Every single one of them. And not just the men, but the women and the children too. However, this is all well perceived and suspected by any member of the audience. But that's not our job as fans, is it? We go much deeper than the surface. The main reason Anakin killed the younglings was to submerse himself into the dark side, killing off Anakin completely and being reborn as Darth Vader. Now if you haven't checked out the Darth Vader comics, I highly recommend it, but for those who haven't, we're gonna go over it quickly here. Specifically in issue 24, we see he has visions and dreams of himself battling Anakin on Mustafar in a clash of evil versus good. Ultimately, the evil side always winning until the very moment Luke finally breaks through to him at the end of Return of the Jedi. Anakin wanted nothing more than to save Padme and become the most powerful Jedi in the galaxy, dark or light, it didn't matter to him. The more evil, unthinkable deeds a Sith practices, the more cemented they are to the dark side, making them more powerful, more hateful, and more in pain. Just like when Kylo killed his own father, Han Solo, he knew it was hard for him. You can see the tears in his eyes before he does it, but he knew this was the path he wanted. So by killing him, there was no turning back. You don't just slaughter your family face to face, then go back to the light side and forget everything that you did. That haunts you forever, as I'm sure killing the younglings haunted Anakin. As you can see, he has tears later on as well, remorseful of the path he has chosen and the things he's done, but inevitably doing it for the greater good of his selfish desires or so he foolishly thought. In my opinion, on a side tangent, if the Sith learned to create life and stop others from dying, so could the Jedi. As I've explained in my Could Master Yoda Create Life video, which I highly recommend you check out after this one. Now, you remember in The Force Awakens when we saw Kylo constantly banging on his wound that Chewbacca had delivered to him with his Wookiee bowcaster after he killed Han Solo during the final battle scene with Rey and Finn. Why was he doing this? It was to create more pain for himself and bleed harder, creating more hatred and anger, allowing himself to draw more power from the dark side. Now ask yourself this, have you ever been in so much physical pain that you sometimes enjoy it? That it makes you feel more angry or tough if you feel more pain? That's exactly what happened in all these situations. Anakin wanted more pain to dive deeper into the dark side and pledge himself to Palpatine's teachings, proving his loyalty to the Emperor who was his key master through the gates into unlimited power.
To many who watch Star Wars, especially the Revenge of the Sith, they may see it clear as day as to why Anakin betrayed the Jedi, and essentially why he thought they were evil. They may think, well, he was crazy, he hated the Jedi, or because he wanted to save his wife. While all of these answers could be true, there is much more to the reason than our minds could hypothesize. I think the only way to do it is to hear it from Anakin's point of view directly in the aftermath of the events. In the book following the Revenge of the Sith novelization, The Dark Lord, Vader explains to himself as he goes over the events in his mind, how he had executed Sidious' commands because the Jedi would never have understood his decision to kill Mace Windu and the rest of the Odor so that Padme might survive his nightmares. He felt the Jedi would stand in the way of his decisions regarding the fate of the galaxy. So right here we can see a power struggle and a need for control over what he felt would be the best fate of the galaxy. He then thought of killing Sidious and the events that would ensue after this. He thought of winning the war for the Republic, but he knew then even the Jedi would have fought him to the bitter end for what he did to Mace. The thought of them taking custody of his children paralyzed him, knowing they'd think his children would be powerful assets to the Academy, possibly the most powerful. He thought to himself, if only the Jedi Council hadn't been so set in their ways, so deceived by their own pride, they would have grasped that the Jedi needed to be brought down. He believed the Jedi Order had grown stale, corrupt, and overall, self-serving. In a way, he was right. This was the same reason Count Dooku left the Order, and why Qui-Gon was never on, nor wanted to be, on the Jedi Council. Feeling disrespected at being called the Chosen One, all while being denied the rank of Master, Anakin felt they were holding him back. He deemed it unsettling that they didn't trust him enough, yet expected him to do their dirty work, to lie for them and spy on the Chancellor. He mumbled under his breath by calling them old fools. I believe if we observe the Jedi Council from Anakin's views, this would give a better understanding of how he really felt. So imagine being taken from your mother from your home planet as a young boy to become a Jedi Knight. Don't look back. Your master dies and now you're pawned off to his apprentice. You're forbidden from ever visiting your mother again even though you have feelings of her dying and in need of your help. Because of the Jedi's rules, you get married in secret to Padme and keep it secret from everyone. This is extremely uncomfortable. You are promised to become a peacekeeper but get turned into a general of war. This would make you resent the Jedi for their hypocrisy. They abandon your Padawan Ahsoka for being accused of murder. Then the Jedi want you to spy on one of the only people you trust, Palpatine. Now remember, Palpatine was the only person Anakin told about the Sand People and his deeper secrets. This goes to show just how much he trusted Palpatine and the relationship they had. They tell you to accept the death of those you love, just like when Yoda told Anakin during his indirect confession about Padme dying. When sensing the future, Anakin, the fear of loss is a path to the dark side. I won't let these visions come true, Master Yoda. And then... They try to kill Palpatine without even giving him a fair trial. He must stand trial. He has control of the Senate and the courts. He's too dangerous to be left alive. If we look at it from his eyes, with all this pain and unnecessary pressure to be the Chosen One, yet denied the rank he felt he deserved, we can justify why he thought the Jedi were perhaps evil, and thus leading to his turn. However, I think the word evil is a bit of a far stretch for Anakin, as he was the one who killed younglings. He should have just said they were unfair or cruel, but evil is just a whole nother game altogether. What does everyone watching think? Were the Jedi evil just from Anakin's point of view or entirely? The Jedi are evil! Should Palpatine have been given trial before being executed? What would have happened if Mace Windu showed up with Yoda and the other Jedi Master?